This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This chapter read by Zale Schaefer. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book Two, The Golden Thread. Chapter Twenty Two, The Sea Still Rises. Haggard St. Antoine had had only one exultant week in which to soften his modicum of hard and bitter bread to such extent as he could, with the relish of fraternal embraces and congratulations, when Madame Defarge sat at her counter as usual, presiding over the customers. Madame Defarge wore no rose in her head, for the great brotherhood of spies had become, even in one short week, extremely chary of trusting themselves to the saints' mercies. The lamps across his streets had a portentously elastic swing with them. Madame Defarge, with her arms folded, sat in the morning light and heat, contemplating the wine-shop and the street. In both there were several knots of loungers, squalid and miserable, but now with a manifest sense of power enthroned on their distress. The raggedest nightcap, awry on the wretchedest head, had this crooked significance in it. I know how hard it has grown for me, the wearer of this, to support life in myself. But do you know how easy it has grown for me, the wearer of this, to destroy life in you? Every lean bare arm that had been without work before had this work always ready for it now, that it could strike. The fingers of the knitting women were vicious, with the experience that they could tear. There was a change in the appearance of St. Antoine. The image had been hammering into this for hundreds of years, and the last finishing blows had told mightily on the expression. Madame Defarge sat observing it with such suppressed approval as was to be desired in the leader of the St. Antoine women. One of her sisterhood knitted beside her, the short, rather plump wife of a starved grocer, and the mother of two children withal, this lieutenant had already earned the complimentary name of the Vengeance. Hark, said the vengeance, listen then, who comes? As if a train of powder laid from the outermost bound of the St. Antoine quarter to the wine-shop door had been suddenly fired, a fast-spreading murmur came rushing along. It is Defarge, said Madame. Silence, patriots! Defarge came in breathless, pulled off a red cap he wore, and looked around him. Listen everywhere, said Madame again. Listen to him! Defarge stood, panting, against a background of eager eyes and open mouths formed outside the door. All those within the wine-shop had sprung to their feet. "'Say then, my husband, what is it?' "'News from the other world.' "'How then?' cried Madame, contemptuously. "'The other world? Does everybody here recall old Foulon, who told the famished people that they might eat grass, and who died and went to hell? "'Everybody from all throats.' The news is of him. He is among us. Among us, from the universal throat again. And dead? Not dead. He feared us so much, and with reason, that he caused himself to be represented as dead, and had a grand mock funeral. But they have found him alive, hiding in the country, and have brought him in. I have seen him but now, on his way to the Hôtel de Ville, a prisoner. Have I said he had reason to fear us? Say all. Had he reason? Wretched old sinner of more than threescore years and ten, if he had never known it yet, he would have known it in his heart of hearts if he could have heard the answering cry. A moment of profound silence followed. Defarge and his wife looked steadfastly at one another. The vengeance stooped, and the jar of a drum was heard as she moved it at her feet behind the counter. "'Patriots,' said Defarge in a determined voice, "'are we ready?' Instantly Madame Defarge's knife was in her girdle, the drum was beating in the streets as if it and a drummer had flown together by magic, and the vengeance, uttering terrific shrieks and flinging her arms about her head like all the forty furies at once, was tearing from house to house, rousing the women. The men were terrible in the bloody-minded anger with which they looked from windows, caught up what arms they had and came pouring down into the streets. But the women were a sight to chill the boldest. From such household occupations as their bare poverty yielded, from their children, 
from their aged and their sick crouching on the bare ground, famished and naked. They ran out with streaming hair, urging one another and themselves to madness with the wildest cries and actions. Villain Foulon taken, my sister. Old Foulon taken, my mother. Miscreant Foulon taken, my daughter. Then a score of others ran into the midst of these, beating their breasts, tearing their hair, and screaming, Foulon alive! Foulon who told the starving people they might eat grass! Foulon who told my old father that he might eat grass when I had no bread to give him! Foulon who told my baby it might suck grass when these breasts were dry with want! O oh, mother of God, this Foulon, O oh, heaven, our suffering, hear me, my dead baby and my withered father, I swear on my knees, on these stones, to avenge you on Foulon. Husbands and brothers and young men, give us the blood of Foulon, give us the heart of Foulon, give us the body and soul of Foulon, rend Foulon to pieces and dig him into the ground that grass may grow from him. With these cries, numbers of the women, lashed into blind frenzy, whirled about, striking and tearing at their own friends, until they dropped into a passionate swoon, and were only saved by the men belonging to them from being trampled underfoot. Nevertheless, not a moment was lost, not a moment. This Foulon was at the Hotel de Ville, and might be loosed. Never if Saint Antoine knew his own sufferings, insults, and wrongs. Armed men and women flocked out of the quarter so fast, and drew even these last dregs after them with such a force of suction, that within a quarter of an hour there was not a human creature in St. Antoine's bosom, but a few old crones and the wailing children. No, they were all by that time choking the hall of examination, where this old man, ugly and wicked, was, and overflowing into the adjacent open space and streets. The Defarges, husband and wife, the Vengeance, the Jacques Three, were in the first press, and at no great distance from him in the hall. "'See!' cried Madame, pointing with her knife. "'See the old villain bound with ropes! That was well done to tie a bunch of grass upon his back! Ha! ha! That was well done! Let him eat it now!' Madame put her knife under her arm and clapped her hands as at a play. The people immediately behind Madame Dufarge, explaining the cause of her satisfaction to those behind them, and those again explaining to others and those to others, the neighboring streets resounded with the clapping of hands. Similarly, during two or three hours of drawl and the winnowing of many bushels of words, Madame Dufarge's frequent expressions of impatience were taken up with marvelous quickness at a distance the more readily because certain men who had by some wonderful exercise of agility climbed up the external architecture to look in from the windows knew Madame Defarge well and acted as a telegraph between her and the crowd outside the building. At length the sun rose up so high that it struck a kindly ray as of hope or protection directly down upon the old prisoner's head. The favor was too much to bear. In an instant the barrier of dust and chaff that had stood surprisingly long went to the winds, and St. Antoine had got him. It was known directly to the furthest confines of the crowd. Defarge had but sprung over a railing at a table, and folded the miserable wretch in a deadly embrace. Madame Defarge had but followed and turned her hand in one of the ropes with which he was tied. The Vengeance and Jacques Three were not yet up with them and the men at the windows had not yet swooped into the hall like birds of prey from their high perches, when the cry seemed to go up all over the city, Bring him out! Bring him to the lamp! Down and up, and head foremost on the steps of the building, now on his knees, now on his feet, now on his back, dragged and struck at, and stifled by the bunches of grass and straw that were thrust into his face by hundreds of hands, torn, bruised, panting, bleeding, yet always entreating and beseeching for mercy. Now full of vehement agony of action, with a small, clear space about him as the people drew one another back that they might see. Now a log of dead wood drawn through a forest of legs. He was hauled to the nearest street corner where one of the fatal lamps swung, and there Madame Dufarge let him go, as a cat might have done to a mouse and silently and composedly looked at him while they made ready, and while he besought her. The women passionately screeching at him all the time, and the men sternly calling out to have him killed with grass in his mouth. 
Once he went aloft, and the rope broke, and they caught him shrieking. Twice he went aloft, and the rope broke, and they caught him shrieking. Then the rope was merciful and held him, and his head was soon upon a pike, with grass enough in the mouth for all St. Antoine to dance at the sight of. Nor was this the end of the day's bad work, for St. Antoine so shouted and danced his angry blood up that it boiled again on hearing when the day closed that in the son-in-law of the dispatched another of the people's enemies and insulters was coming into Paris under a guard five hundred strong in cavalry alone. St. Antoine wrote his crimes on flaring sheets of paper, seized him, would have torn him out of the breast of an army to bear Foulon company, set his head and heart on pikes, and carried the three spoils of the day in wolf procession through the streets. Not before dark did the men and women come back to the children, wailing and breadless. Then the miserable baker's shops were beset by long files of them, patiently waiting to buy bad bread. And while they waited, with stomachs faint and empty, they beguiled the time by embracing one another on the triumphs of the day, and achieving them again in gossip. Gradually these strings of ragged people shortened and frayed away, and then poor lights began to shine in high windows, and slender fires were made in the streets at which neighbors cooked in common, afterwards supping at their doors. Scanty and insufficient suppers those, and innocent of meat, as of most other sauce to wretched bread. Yet human fellowship infused some nourishment into the flinty viands, and struck some sparks of cheerfulness out of them. Fathers and mothers who had had their full share in the worst of the day played gently with their meager children, and lovers with such a world around them and before them loved and hoped. It was almost morning when Defarge's wine shop parted with its last knot of customers, and Monsieur Defarge said to Madame his wife in husky tones while fastening the door, "'At last it is come, my dear.' "'Eh, well,' returned Madame, "'almost.' St. Antoine slept, the Defarges slept, even the Vengeance slept with her starved grocer, and the drum was at rest. The drums was the only voice in St. Antoine that blood and hurry had not changed. The vengeance, as custodian of the drum, could have wakened him up and had the same speech out of him as before the Bastille fell, or old Foulon was seized. Not so with the hoarse tones of the men and women in St. Antoine's bosom. End of chapter 22 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Eastman, February 26, 2006. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book 2, Chapter 23. Fire Rises. There was a change on the village where the fountain fell, and where the mender of roads went forth daily to hammer out of the stones on the highway such morsels of bread as might serve for patches to hold his poor ignorant soul and his poor reduced body together. The prison on the crag was not so dominant as of yore. There were soldiers to guard it, but not many. There were officers to guard the soldiers, but not one of them knew what his men would do, beyond this, that it would probably not be what he was ordered. Far and wide lay a ruined country, yielding nothing but desolation. Every green leaf, every blade of grass and blade of grain, was as shriveled and poor as the miserable people. Everything was bowed down, dejected, oppressed, and broken. Habitations, fences, domesticated animals, men, women, children, and the soil that bore them, all worn out. Monsignor, often a most worthy individual gentleman, was a national blessing, gave a chivalrous tone to things, was a polite example of luxurious and shining life, and a great deal more to equal purpose. Nevertheless, Monsignor as a class had 
somehow or other, brought things to this. Strange that creation, designed expressly for Monsignor, should be so soon wrung dry and squeezed out. There must be something short-sighted in the eternal arrangements, surely. Thus it was, however, and the last drop of blood having been extracted from the flints, and the last screw of the rack having been turned so often that its purchase crumbled, and it now turned and turned with nothing to bite, Monsignor began to run away from a phenomenon so low and unaccountable. But this was not the change on the village, and on many a village like it. For scores of years gone by, Monsignor had squeezed it and wrung it, and had seldom graced it with his presence, except for the pleasures of the chase, now found in hunting the people, now found in hunting the beasts, for whose preservation Monsignor made edifying spaces of barbarous and barren wilderness. No, the change consisted in the appearance of strange faces of low caste, rather than in the disappearance of the high caste, chiseled, and otherwise beautified and beautifying features of Monsignor. For in these times, as the mender of roads worked solitary, in the dust, not often troubling himself to reflect that dust he was, and to dust he must return, being for the most part too much occupied in thinking how little he had for supper, and how much more he would eat if he had it. In these times, as he raised his eyes from his lonely labor and viewed the prospect, he would see some rough figure approaching on foot, the like of which was once a rarity in those parts, but was now a frequent presence. As it advanced, the mender of roads would discern without surprise that it was a shaggy-haired man of almost barbarian aspect, tall, in wooden shoes that were clumsy even to the eyes of a mender of roads, grim, rough, swart, steeped in the mud and dust of many highways, dank with the marshy moisture of many low grounds, sprinkled with the thorns and leaves and moss of many byways through woods. Such a man came upon him like a ghost at noon in the July weather, as he sat on his heap of stones under a bank, taking such shelter as he could get from a shower of hail. The man looked at him, looked at the village in the hollow, at the mill, and at the prison on the crag. When he had identified these objects in what benighted mind he had, he said, in a dialect that was just intelligible, How goes it, Jacques? All well, Jacques. Touch, then. They joined hands, and the man sat down on the heap of stones. No dinner? Nothing but supper now, said the mender of roads, with a hungry face. It is the fashion, growled the man. I meet no dinner anywhere. He took out a blackened pipe, filled it, lighted it with flint and steel, pulled at it until it was in a bright glow, then suddenly held it from him, and dropped something into it from between his finger and thumb that blazed and went out in a puff of smoke. Touch, then. It was the turn of the mender of roads to say it this time after observing these operations. They again joined hands. "'Tonight,' said the mender of roads. "'Tonight,' said the man, putting the pipe in his mouth. "'Where?' "'Here.' He and the mender of roads sat on the heap of stones, looking silently at one another, with the hail driving in between them like a pygmy charge of bayonets, until the sky began to clear over the village. "'Show me,' said the traveller then, moving to the brow of the hill. "'See,' returned the mender of roads with extended finger, "'you go down here and straight through the street and past the fountain—' "'To the devil with all that,' interrupted the other, rolling his eye over the landscape. "'I go through no streets and past no fountains. "'Well?' Well, about two leagues beyond the summit of that hill, above the village. Good. When do you cease to work? 
at sunset. Will you wake me before departing? I have walked two nights without resting. Let me finish my pipe, and I shall sleep like a child. Will you wake me? Surely. The wayfarer smoked his pipe out, put it in his breast, slipped off his great wooden shoes, and lay down on his back on the heap of stones. He was fast asleep directly. As the road-mender plied his dusty labor, and the hail-clouds, rolling away, revealed bright bars and streaks of sky, which were responded to by silver gleams upon the landscape, the little man, who wore a red cap now in place of his blue one, seemed fascinated by the figure on the heap of stones. His eyes were so often turned towards it that he used his tools mechanically, and one would have said to very poor account. The bronze face, the shaggy black hair and beard, the coarse woolen red cap, the rough medley dress of homespun stuff and hairy skins of beasts, the powerful frame attenuated by spare living, and the sullen and desperate compression of the lips in sleep, inspired the mender of roads with awe. The traveller had travelled far, and his feet were footsore, and his ankles chafed and bleeding. His great shoes, stuffed with leaves and grass, had been heavy to drag over the many long leagues, and his clothes were chafed into holes, as he himself was, into sores. Stooping down beside him, the road-mender tried to get a peep at secret weapons in his breast or where not. But in vain, for he slept with his arms crossed upon him, and set as resolutely as his lips. Fortified towns with their stockades, guard-houses, gates, trenches, and drawbridges, seemed to the mender of roads to be so much air as against this figure. And when he lifted his eyes from it to the horizon and looked around, he saw in his small fancy similar figures, stopped by no obstacle, tending to centers all over France. The man slept on, indifferent to showers of hail and intervals of brightness, to sunshine on his face and shadow, to the paltering lumps of dull ice on his body and the diamonds into which the sun changed them, until the sun was low in the west and the sky was glowing. Then the mender of roads, having got his tools together and all things ready to go down into the village, roused him. Good, said the sleeper, rising on his elbow. Two leagues beyond the summit of the hill? About. About. Good. The mender of roads went home, with the dust going on before him according to the set of the wind, and was soon at the fountain, squeezing himself in among the lean kine brought there to drink, and appearing even to whisper to them, in his whispering to all the village. When the village had taken its poor supper, it did not creep to bed, as it usually did, but came out of doors again, and remained there. A curious contagion of whispering was upon it, and also, when it gathered together at the fountain in the dark, another curious contagion of looking expectantly at the sky, in one direction only. Monsieur Gabel, chief functionary of the place, became uneasy, went out on his housetop alone, and looked in that direction too, glanced down from behind his chimneys at the darkening faces by the fountain below, and sent word to the sacristan who kept the keys of the church that there might be need to ring the tocsin by and by. The night deepened. The trees environing the old chateau, keeping its solitary state apart, moved in a rising wind as though they threatened the pile of building massive and dark in the gloom. Up the two terrace flights of steps the rain ran wildly, and beat at the great door, like a swift messenger rousing those within. Uneasy rushes of wind went through the hall, among the old spears and knives, and passed lamenting up the stairs, and shook the curtains of the bed where the last marquis had slept. 
east, west, north, and south, through the woods. Four heavy treading, unkempt figures crushed the high grass and cracked the branches, striding on cautiously to come together in the courtyard. Four lights broke out there, and moved away in different directions, and all was black again. But not for long. Presently the chateau began to make itself strangely visible by some light of its own, as though it were growing luminous. Then a flickering streak played behind the architecture of the front, picking out transparent places and showing where balustrades, arches, and windows were. Then it soared higher and grew broader and brighter. Soon, from a score of the great windows, flames burst forth, and the stone faces awakened, stared out of fire. A faint murmur arose about the house from the few people who were left there, and there was a saddling of a horse and riding away. There was spurring and slashing through the darkness, and bridle was drawn in the space by the village fountain, and the horse in a foam stood at Monsieur Gabel's door. Help, Gabel! Help, everyone! The tocsin rang impatiently, but other help, if that were any, there was none. The mender of roads and two hundred and fifty particular friends stood with folded arms at the fountain, looking at the pillar of fire in the sky. It must be forty feet high, said they grimly, and never moved. The rider from the chateau and the horse in a foam clattered away through the village and galloped up the stony steep to the prison on the crag. At the gate a group of officers were looking at the fire, removed from them a group of soldiers. Help, gentlemen, officers! The chateau is on fire! Valuable objects may be saved from the flames by timely aid! Help, help! The officers looked towards the soldiers, who looked at the fire, gave no orders, and answered with shrugs and biting of lips, It must burn! As the rider rattled down the hill again and through the street, the village was illuminating. The mender of roads and the two hundred and fifty particular friends, inspired as one man and woman by the idea of lighting up, had darted into their houses, and were putting candles in every dull little pane of glass. The general scarcity of everything occasioned candles to be borrowed in a rather peremptory manner of Monsieur Gabel, and in a moment of reluctance and hesitation on that functionary's part, the mender of roads, once so submissive to authority, had remarked that carriages were good to make bonfires with, and that post-horses would roast. The chateau was left to itself to flame and burn. In the roaring and raging of the conflagration, a red-hot wind, driving straight from the infernal regions, seemed to be blowing the edifice away. With the rising and falling of the blaze, the stone faces showed as if they were in torment. When great masses of stone and timber fell, the face with the two dints in the nose became obscured. Anon struggled out of the smoke again, as if it were the face of the cruel Marquis, burning at the stake and contending with the fire. The chateau burned. The nearest trees, laid hold of by the fire, scorched and shriveled. Trees at a distance, fired by the four fierce figures, begirt the blazing edifice with a new forest of smoke. Molten lead and iron boiled in the marble basin of the fountain. The water ran dry. The extinguisher tops of the towers vanished like ice before the heat, and trickled down into four rugged wells of flame. Great rents and splits branched out in the solid walls like crystallization, Stupefied birds wheeled about and dropped into the furnace. Four fierce figures trudged away, east, west, north, and south, along the night-enshrouded roads, guided by the beacon they had lighted, towards their next destination. The illuminated village had seized hold of the toxin, and abolishing the lawful ringer, 
rang for joy. Not only that, but the village, light-headed with famine, fire, and bell-ringing, and bethinking itself that Monsieur Gabel had to do with the collection of rent and taxes, though it was but a small installment of taxes, and no rent at all that Gabel had got in those latter days, became impatient for an interview with him, and surrounding his house summoned him to come forth for personal conference. Whereupon, Monsieur Gabel did heavily bar his door, and retire to hold counsel with himself. The result of that conference was that Gabel again withdrew himself to his housetop behind his stack of chimneys, this time resolved, if his door were broken in, he was a small southern man of retaliative temperament, to pitch himself head foremost over the parapet and crush a man or two below. Probably Monsieur Gabel passed a long night up there, with the distant chateau for fire and candle, and the beating at his door, combined with the joy ringing, for music. Not to mention his having an ill-omened lamp slung across the road before his posting-house gate, which the village showed a lively inclination to displace in his favour. A trying suspense, to be passing a whole summer night on the brink of the black ocean, ready to take that plunge into it, upon which M. Gabel had resolved. But the friendly dawn appearing at last, and the rush candles of the village guttering out, the people happily dispersed, and M. Gabel came down, bringing his life with him for that while. Within a hundred miles, and in the light of other fires, there were other functionaries less fortunate, that night and other nights, whom the rising sun found hanging across once peaceful streets where they had been born and bred. Also, there were other villagers and townspeople, less fortunate than the mender of roads and his fellows, upon whom the functionaries and soldiery turned with success, and whom they strung up in their turn. But the fierce figures were steadily wending east, west, north, and south, be that as it would, and whosoever hung, fire burned. The altitude of the gallows that would turn to water and quench it, no functionary, by any stretch of mathematics, was able to calculate successfully. End of Book 2, Chapter 23 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Minter. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book Two, Chapter Twenty Four. Drawn to the Lodestone Rock. In such risings of fire and risings of sea, the firm earth shaken by the rushes of an angry ocean which had now no ebb, but which was always on the flow, higher and higher, to the terror and wonder of the beholders on the shore, three years of tempest were consumed. Three more birthdays of little Lucy had been woven by the golden thread into the peaceful tissue of the life of her home. Many a night and many a day had its inmates listened to the echoes in the corner, with hearts that failed them when they heard the thronging feet for the footsteps had become to their minds as the footsteps of a people, tumultuous under a red flag, and with their country declared in danger, changed into wild beasts by terrible enchantment, long persisted in. Monseigneur, as a class, had dissociated himself from the phenomenon of his not being appreciated, of his being so little wanted in France, as to incur considerable danger of receiving his dismissal from it and this life together. Like the fabled rustic who raised the devil with infinite pains, and was so terrified at the sight of him that he could ask the enemy no question, but immediately fled, so Monseigneur, after boldly reading the Lord's Prayer backwards for a great number of years, and performing many other potent spells for compelling the evil one, 
no sooner beheld him in his terrors than he took to his noble heels. The shining bull's-eye of the court was gone, or it would have been the mark for a hurricane of national bullets. It had never been a good eye to see with, had long had the moat in it of Lucifer's pride, Sardanapulus's luxury, and Amold's blindness, but it had dropped out and was gone. The court, from that exclusive inner circle to its outermost rotten ring of intrigue, corruption, and dissimulation, was all gone together. Royalty was gone, had been besieged in its palace, and suspended, when the last tidings came over. The August of the year 1792 was come, and Monseigneur was by this time scattered far and wide. As was natural, the headquarters and great gathering place of Monseigneur in London was Telson's Bank. Spirits are supposed to haunt the places where their bodies most resorted, and Monseigneur, without a guinea, haunted the spot where his guineas used to be. Moreover, it was the spot to which such French intelligence as was most to be relied upon came quickest. Again, Telson's was a munificent house, and extended great liberality to old customers who had fallen from their high estate. Again, those nobles who had seen the coming storm in time, and anticipating plunder or confiscation, had made provident remittances to Telson's, were always to be heard of there by their needy brethren. To which it must be added that every newcomer from France reported himself and his tidings at Telson's almost as a matter of course. For such variety of reasons, Telson's was at the time, as to French intelligence, a kind of high exchange, and this was so well known to the public, and the inquiries made there were in consequence so numerous, that Telson sometimes wrote the latest news out in a line or so, and posted it in the bank windows, for all who ran through Temple Bar to read. On a steaming, misty afternoon, Mr. Lorry sat at his desk, and Charles Darnay stood leaning on it, talking with him in a low voice. The penitential den, once set apart for interviews with the house, was now the news exchange, and was filled to overflowing. It was within half an hour or so of the time of closing. "'But although you are the youngest man that ever lived,' said Charles Darnay, rather hesitating, "'I must still suggest to you—' "'I understand. "'That I am too old,' said Mr. Lorry. "'Unsettled weather, a long journey, a uncertain means of travelling, a disorganised country, a city that may not even be safe for you.' "'My dear Charles,' said Mr. Lorry, with cheerful confidence, "'You touch some of the reasons for my going, not for my staying away. "'It's safe enough for me. "'Nobody will care to interfere with an old fellow of hard upon four score, "'when there are so many people there much better worth interfering with. "'As to its being a disorganised city, "'if it were not a disorganised city, "'there would be no occasion to send somebody from our house here to our house there, "'who knows the city and the business of old.' and is in Telson's confidence. As to the uncertain travelling, the long journey, and the winter weather, if I were not prepared to submit myself to a few inconveniences for the sake of Telson's, after all these years, who ought to be? "'I wish I were going myself,' said Charles Darnay, somewhat restlessly, and like one thinking aloud. "'Indeed, you're a pretty fellow to object and advise,' exclaimed Mr. Lorry. "'You wish you were going yourself, and you a Frenchman born? "'You're a wise counsellor. "'My dear Mr. Lorry, it is because I am a Frenchman born at the thought, "'which I did not mean to utter here, however, has passed through my mind often. "'One cannot help thinking, having had some sympathy for the miserable people, "'and having abandoned something to them.' "'He spoke here in his former thoughtful manner.' that one might be listened to, and might have the power to persuade to some restraint. Only last night, after you had left us, when I was talking to Lucy— When you were talking to Lucy? 
Mr. Lorry repeated. Yes. I wonder you're not ashamed to mention the name of Lucy, wishing you were going to France at this time of day. However, I am not going, said Charles Darnay with a smile. It is more to the purpose that you say you are. And I am, in plain reality. The truth is, my dear Charles, Mr. Lorry glanced at the distant house and lowered his voice, you can have no conception of the difficulty with which our business is transacted, and of the peril in which our books and papers over yonder are involved. The Lord above knows what the compromising consequences would be to numbers of people if some of our documents were seized or destroyed, and they might be at any time, you know. For who can say that Paris is not set afire to-day, or sacked to-morrow? Now, a judicious selection from these, with the least possible delay, and the burying of them, or otherwise getting them out of harm's way, is within the power, without loss of precious time, of scarcely any one but myself, if any one. And shall I hang back, when Tellson's knows this, and says this, Tellson's, whose bread I've eaten these sixty years, because I'm a little stiff about the joints, why, I am a boy, sir, to half a dozen old codgers here. How I admire the gallantry of your youthful spirit, Mr. Lorry. Tut, nonsense, sir. And my dear Charles, said Mr. Lorry, glancing at the house again, you are to remember that getting things out of Paris at this present time, no matter what things, is next to an impossibility. Papers and precious matters were this very day brought to us here. I, I speak in strict confidence. It's not business-like to whisper it even to you. By the strangest bearers you can imagine, every one of whom had his head hanging on by a single hair as he passed the barriers. At another time our parcels would come and go as easily as in business-like old England. But now everything is stopped. "'And do you really go to-night?' "'I really go to-night, for the case has become too pressing to admit of delay. "'And do you take no one with you? "'All sorts of people have been proposed to me, but I'll have nothing to say to any of them. "'I intend to take Jerry. "'Jerry has been my bodyguard on Sunday nights for a long time past, and I'm used to him. "'Nobody will suspect Jerry of being anything but an English bulldog.' or of having any design in his head but to fly at any one who touches his master. "'I must say again that I heartily admire your gallantry and youthfulness.' "'I must say again, nonsense, nonsense. When I have executed this little commission, I shall perhaps accept Tellson's proposal to retire and live at my ease. Time enough, then, to think about growing old.' This dialogue had taken place at Mr. Lorry's usual desk, with Monseigneur swarming within a yard or two of it, boastful of what he would do to avenge himself on the rascal people before long. It was too much the way of Monseigneur under his reverses as a refugee, and it was much too much the way of native British orthodoxy to talk of this terrible revolution, as though it were the only harvest ever known under the skies that had not been sown as if nothing had ever been done or omitted to be done that had led to it, as if observers of the wretched millions in France, and of the misused and perverted resources that should have made them prosperous, had not seen it inevitably coming, years before, and had not in plain words recorded what they saw. Such vapouring, combined with the extravagant plots of Monseigneur for the restoration of a state of things that had utterly exhausted itself, and worn out heaven and earth as well as itself, was hard to be endured without some remonstrance by any sane man who knew the truth. And it was such vapouring all about his ears, like a troublesome confusion of blood in his own head, added to a latent uneasiness in his mind, which had already made Charles Darnay restless, and which still kept him so. Among the talkers were Stryver of the King's Bench Bar, far on his way to state promotion, and therefore loud on the theme, broaching to Monseigneur his devices for blowing the people up and exterminating them from the face of the earth, and doing without them, and for accomplishing many similar objects, 
akin in their nature to the abolition of eagles by sprinkling salt on the tails of the race. Him Darnay heard with a particular feeling of objection, and Darnay stood divided between going away that he might hear no more, and remaining to interpose his word, when the thing that was to be went on to shape itself out. The house approached Mr. Lorry, and laying a soiled and unopened letter before him, asked if he had yet discovered any traces of the person to whom it was addressed. The house laid the letter down so close to Darnay that he saw the direction, the more quickly because it was his own right name. The address, turned into English, ran, very pressing, to Monsieur Heretofore, the Marquis saint Evremond of France, confided to the cares of Messrs. Telson and Go, Bankers, London, England. On the marriage morning Dr. Manette had made it his one urgent and express request to Charles Darnay that the secret of this name should be, unless he, the doctor, dissolved the obligation, kept inviolate between them. Nobody else knew it to be his name. His own wife had no suspicion of the fact. Mr. Lorry could have none. "'No,' said Mr. Lorry, in reply to the house. "'I have referred it, I think, to everybody now here, "'and no one can tell me where this gentleman is to be found.' "'The hands of the clock, verging upon the hour of closing the bank, "'there was a general set of the current of talkers past Mr. Lorry's desk. "'He held the letter out inquiringly, "'and Monseigneur looked at it in the person of this plotting and indignant refugee, and Monseigneur looked at it in the person of that plotting and indignant refugee, and this, that, and the other, all had something disparaging to say, in French or in English, concerning the Marquis who was not to be found. Nephew, I believe, but in any case degenerate successor of the polished Marquis who was murdered, said one. Happy to say I never knew him. "'A craven who abandoned his post,' said another. "'This Monseigneur had been got out of Paris, legs uppermost, and half suffocated in a low of hay, some years ago. "'Infected with the new doctrines,' said a third, eyeing the direction through his glass in passing. "'Set himself in opposition to the last Marquis, abandoned the estates when he inherited them, and left them to the raffineur.' "'They will recompense him now, I hope, as he deserves.' "'Hey,' said the blatant driver, "'did he, though? Is that the sort of fellow? "'Let's look at his infamous name. Damn the fellow!' Darnay, unable to restrain himself any longer, touched Mr. Stryver on the shoulder, and said, "'I know the fellow.' "'Do you, by Jupiter?' said Stryver. "'I'm sorry for it.' "'Why?' "'Why, Mr. Darnay? Do you hear what he did? Don't ask why in these times.' "'But I do ask why.' "'Then I tell you again, Mr. Darnay. I'm sorry for it. I'm sorry to hear you putting any such extraordinary questions. Here's a fellow who, infected by the most pestilent and blasphemous code of devilry that was ever known, abandoned his property to the vilest scum of the earth that ever did at murder by wholesale.' "'And you ask me why I'm sorry that a man who instructs youth knows him? "'Well, but I'll answer you I'm sorry, because I believe there is contamination in such a scoundrel. "'That's why.' "'Mindful of the secret, Darnay with great difficulty checked himself, and said, "'You may not understand the gentleman.' "'I understand how to put you in a corner, Mr. Darnay,' said Bully Stryver, "'and I'll do it.' "'If this fellow is a gentleman, I don't understand him. "'You may tell him so with my compliments. "'You may also tell him, from me, "'that after abandoning his worldly goods and position to this butcherly mob, "'I wonder he's not at the head of them.' "'But no, gentlemen,' said Stryver, looking all round and snapping his fingers, "'I know something of human nature, and I tell you that you'll never find a fellow like this fellow "'trusting himself to the mercies of such precious protégés. "'No, gentlemen, he'll always show him a clean pair of heels very early in the scuffle, and sneak away.' 
With those words, and a final snap of his fingers, Mr. Stryver shouldered himself into Fleet Street, amidst the general approbation of his hearers. Mr. Lorry and Charles Darnay were left alone at the desk, in the general departure from the bank. "'Will you take charge of the letter?' said Mr. Lorry. "'You know where to deliver it?' "'I do.' "'Will you undertake to explain that we suppose it to have been addressed here, on the chance of our knowing where to forward it, and that it has been here some time?' "'I will do so. Do you start for Paris from here?' "'From here, at eight. "'I will come back to see you off.' Very ill at ease with himself, and with Stryver, and most other men, Darnay made the best of his way into the quiet of the temple, opened the letter, and read it. These were its contents. Prison of the Abbé, Paris, June 21, 1792. Monsieur Heretofore the Marquis. After having long been in danger of my life at the hands of the village, I have been seized with great violence and indignity, and brought a long journey on foot to Paris. On the road I have suffered a great deal. Nor is that all. My house has been destroyed, razed to the ground. The crime for which I am imprisoned, monsieur, heretofore the Marquis, and for which I shall be summoned before the tribunal, and shall lose my life, without your so generous help, is, they tell me, treason against the majesty of the people." in that I have acted against them for an emigrant. It is in vain I represent that I have acted for them and not against, according to your commands. It is in vain I represent that, before the sequestration of emigrant property, I had remitted the imposts they had ceased to pay, that I had collected no rent, that I had recourse to no process. The only response is that I have acted for an emigrant. And where is that emigrant? Ah, most gracious monsieur, heretofore the Marquis, where is that emigrant? I cry in my sleep, where is he? I demand of heaven, will he not come to deliver me? No answer. Ah, monsieur, heretofore the Marquis, I send my desolate cry across the sea, hoping it may perhaps reach your ears through the great bank of Tilson, known at Paris. For the love of heaven, of justice, of generosity, of the honour of your noble name, I supplicate you, monsieur, heretofore the Marquis, to succour and release me. My fault is that I have been true to you. Oh, monsieur, heretofore the Marquis, I pray you to be true to me. From this prison here of horror, whence I every hour tend nearer and nearer to destruction, I send you... Monsieur, heretofore the Marquis, the assurance of my dolorous and unhappy service, your afflicted Gabel. The latent uneasiness in Darnay's mind was roused to vigorous life by this letter, the peril of an old servant and a good one, whose only crime was fidelity to himself and his family, stared him so reproachfully in the face, that as he walked to and fro in the temple, considering what to do, he almost hid his face from the passers-by. He knew very well that in his horror of the deed which had culminated the bad deeds and bad reputation of the old family house, in his resentful suspicions of his uncle, and in the aversion with which his conscience regarded the crumbling fabric that he was supposed to uphold, he had acted imperfectly. He knew very well that in his love for Lucy, his renunciation of his social place, though by no means new to his own mind, had been hurried and incomplete. He knew that he ought to have systematically worked it out and supervised it, and that he had meant to do it, and that it had never been done. The happiness of his own chosen English home, the necessity of being always actively employed, the swift changes and troubles of the time which had followed on one another so fast, that the events of this week annihilated the immature plans of last week, and the events of the week following made all new again. He knew very well that to the force of these circumstances he had yielded, 
not without disquiet, but still without continuous and accumulating resistance, that he had watched the times for a time of action, and that they had shifted and struggled until the time had gone by, and the nobility were trooping from France by every highway and byway, and their property was in course of confiscation and destruction, and their very names were blotting out was as well known to himself as it could be to any new authority in France that might impeach him for it. But he had oppressed no man, he had imprisoned no man, he was so far from having harshly exacted payment of his dues, that he had relinquished them of his own will, thrown himself on a world with no favour in it, won his own private place there, and earned his own bread. M. Gabel had held the impoverished and involved estate on written instructions, to spare the people, to give them what little there was to give, such fuel as the heavy creditors would let them have in the winter, and such produce as could be saved from the same grip in summer, and no doubt he had put the fact in plea and proof for his own safety, so that it could not but appear now. This favoured the desperate resolution Charles Darnay had begun to make that he would go to Paris. Yes, like the mariner in the old story, the winds and streams had driven him within the influence of the lodestone rock, and it was drawing him to itself, and he must go. Everything that arose before his mind drifted him on, faster and faster, more and more steadily to the terrible attraction. His latent uneasiness had been that bad aims were being worked out in his own unhappy land by bad instruments, and that he, who could not fail to know that he was better than they, was not there, trying to do something to stay bloodshed, and to assert the claims of mercy and humanity. With this uneasiness half stifled and half reproaching him, he had been brought to the pointed comparison of himself with the brave old gentleman in whom duty was so strong. Upon that comparison, injurious to himself, had instantly followed the sneers of Monseigneur, which had stung him bitterly, and those of Striver, which above all were coarse and galling for old reasons. Upon those had followed Gabelle's letter, the appeal of an innocent prisoner in danger of death to his justice, honour, and good name. His resolution was made, he must go to Paris. Yes, the lodestone rock was drawing him, and he must sail on until he struck. He knew of no rock. He saw hardly any danger. The intention with which he had done what he had done, even though he had left it incomplete, presented it before him in an aspect that would be gratefully acknowledged in France, on his presenting himself to assert it. Then that glorious vision of doing good— which is so often the sanguine mirage of so many good minds, arose before him, and he even saw himself in the illusion with some influence to guide this raging revolution that was running so fearfully wild. As he walked to and fro with his resolution made, he considered that neither Lucy nor her father must know of it until he was gone. Lucy should be spared the pain of separation, and her father— always reluctant to turn his thoughts towards the dangerous ground of old, should come to the knowledge of the step as a step taken, and not in the balance of suspense and doubt. How much of the incompleteness of his situation was referable to her father, through the painful anxiety to avoid reviving old associations of France in his mind, he did not discuss with himself. But that circumstance, too, had its influence in his course— he walked to and fro, with thoughts very busy, until it was time to return to Telson's and take leave of Mr. Lorry. As soon as he arrived in Paris, he would present himself to this old friend, but he must say nothing of his intention now. A carriage with post-horses was ready at the bank door, and Jerry was booted and equipped. "'I have delivered that letter,' said Charles Darnay to Mr. Lorry. I would not consent to your being charged with any written answer, but perhaps you will take a verbal one. That I will, and readily, said Mr. Lorry, if it's not dangerous. Not at all, though it is to a prisoner in the Abbey. What is his name? said Mr. Lorry, with his open pocket-book in his hand. 
Gabelle. Gabelle. And what is the message to the unfortunate Gabelle in prison? Simply that he has received the letter and will come. Any time mentioned? He will start upon his journey tomorrow night. Any person mentioned? No. He helped Mr. Lorry to wrap himself in a number of coats and cloaks, and went out with him from the warm atmosphere of the old bank into the misty air of Fleet Street. "'My love to Lucy, and to little Lucy,' said Mr. Lorry at parting, "'and take precious care of them till I come back.' Charles Darnay shook his head and doubtfully smiled as the carriage rolled away. That night, it was the 14th of August, he sat up late, and wrote two fervent letters. One was to Lucy, explaining the strong obligation he was under to go to Paris, and showing her, at length, the reasons that he had for feeling confident that he could become involved in no personal danger there. The other was to the doctor, confiding Lucy and their dear child to his care, and dwelling on the same topics with the strongest assurances. To both he wrote that he would dispatch letters in proof of his safety immediately after his arrival. It was a hard day, that day of being among them, with the first reservation of their joint lives on his mind. It was a hard matter to preserve the innocent deceit of which they were profoundly unsuspicious. But an affectionate glance at his wife, so happy and busy, made him resolute not to tell her what impended. He had been half moved to do it, so strange it was to him to act in anything without her quiet aid and the day passed quickly. Early in the evening he embraced her and her scarcely less dear namesake, pretending that he would return by and by. An imaginary engagement took him out, and he had secreted a valise of clothes ready. And so he emerged into the heavy mist of the heavy streets with a heavier heart. The unseen force was drawing him fast to itself now, and all the tides and winds were setting straight and strong towards it. He left his two letters with a trusty porter, to be delivered half an hour before midnight, and no sooner. Took horse for Dover, and began his journey. For the love of heaven, of justice, of generosity, of the honour of your noble name, was the poor prisoner's cry, with which he strengthened his sinking heart, as he left all that was dear on earth behind him, and floated away for the lodestone rock. End of book two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marion Brown, Toronto, Canada. The Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book Three, Chapter One In Secret The traveller fared slowly on his way, who fared towards Paris from England in the autumn of the year 1792. More than enough of bad roads, bad equipages, and bad horses he would have encountered to delay him, though the fallen and unfortunate King of France had been upon his throne in all his glory but the changed times were fraught with other obstacles than these. Every town gate and village taxing-house had its band of citizen patriots, with their national muskets in a most explosive state of readiness, who stopped all comers and goers, cross-questioned them, inspected their papers, looked for their names and lists of their own, turned them back or sent them on, or stopped them and laid them in hold as their capricious judgment of fancy deemed best for the dawning republic, one and indivisible, of liberty, equality, fraternity, or death. A very few French leagues of his journey were accomplished, when Charles Darnay began to perceive that for him along these country roads there was no hope of return until he should have been declared a good citizen at Paris. Whatever might befall now, he must on to journey's end. Not a mean village closed upon him, not a common barrier dropped across the road behind him, but he knew it to be another iron door in the series that was barred between him and England. 
the universal watchfulness so encompassed him that if he had been taken in a net or were being forwarded to his destination in a cage he could not have felt his freedom were more completely gone this universal watchfulness not only stopped him on the highway twenty times in a stage but retarded his progress twenty times in a day by riding after him and taking him back riding before him and stopping him by anticipation riding with him and keeping him in charge he had been days upon his journey in france alone when he went to bed tired out in a little town on the high road still a long way from paris nothing but the production of the afflicted gabelle's letter from his prison of the abbey would have got him on so far his difficulty at the guard-house in this small place had been such that he felt his journey to have come to a crisis and he was therefore as little surprised as a man could be to find himself awakened at the small inn to which he had been remitted until morning in the middle of the night. Awakened by a timid local functionary and three armed patriots in rough red caps and with pipes in their mouths who sat down on the bed. Emigrant, said the functionary, I am going to send you on to Paris under an escort. Citizen, I desire nothing more than to get to Paris, though I could dispense with the escort. Silence growled a red cap, striking at the coverlet with the butt-end of his musket. Peace, aristocrat. It is, as the good patriot says, observed the timid functionary, you are an aristocrat, and must have an escort, and must pay for it. I have no choice, said Charles Darnay. Choice! Listen to him, cried the same scowling red cap, as if it was not a favour to be protected from the lamp iron. It is always as the good patriot says, observed the functionary. Rise and dress yourself, emigrant. Darnay complied, and was taken back to the guard-house, where other patriots in rough red caps were smoking, drinking, and sleeping by a watch-fire. Here he paid a heavy price for his escort, and hence he started with it on the wet, wet roads at three o'clock in the morning. The escort were two mounted patriots in red caps and tricolored cockades, armed with national muskets and sabres, who rode one on either side of him. The escorted governed his own horse, but a loose line was attached to his bridle, the end of which one of the patriots kept girded round his wrist. In this state they set forth with the sharp rain driving in their faces, clattering at a heavy dragoon trot over the uneven town pavement and out upon the mire deep roads. In this state they traversed without change, except of horses and pace, all the mire deep leagues that lay between them and the capital. They travelled in the night, halting an hour or two after daybreak, and lying by until the twilight fell. The escort were so wretchedly clothed that they twisted straw round their bare legs and thatched their ragged shoulders to keep the wet off. Apart from the personal discomfort of being so attended, and apart from such considerations of present danger as arose from one of the patriots being chronically drunk, and carrying his musket very recklessly, Charles Darnay did not allow the restraint that was laid upon him to awaken any serious fears in his breast, for he reasoned with himself that it could have no reference to the merits of an individual's case that was not yet stated and of representations confirmable by the prisoner in the abbey that were not yet made. But when they came to the town of Beauvais, which they did at eventide, when the streets were filled with people, he could not conceal from himself that the aspect of affairs was very alarming. An ominous crowd gathered to see him dismount of the posting yard, and many voices called out loudly, Down with the emigrant! He stopped in the act of swinging himself out of his saddle, and resuming it in as his safest place, said, Emigrant, my friends, do you not see me here, in France, of my own will? You are a cursed emigrant, cried a farrier, making at him in a furious manner through the press, hammer in hand, and you are a cursed aristocrat. The postmaster interposed himself between this man and the rider's bridle, at which he was evidently making and soothingly said, Let him be, let him be, he will be judged at Paris. Judged, repeated the farrier, swinging his hammer. Aye, and condemned as a traitor. At this the crowd roared approval. 
checking the postmaster, who was for turning his horse's head to the yard, the drunken patriot sat composedly in his saddle looking on, with the line round his wrist. Darnay said, as soon as he could make his voice heard, "'Friends, you deceive yourselves, or you are deceived. I am not a traitor.' "'He lies,' cried the smith. "'He is a traitor since the decree. His life is forfeit to the people. His cursed life is not his own.' At the instant when Darnay saw a rush in the eyes of the crowd, which another instant would have brought upon him, the postmaster turned his horse into the yard, the escort rode in close upon his horse's flanks, and the postmaster shut and barred the crazy double gates. The farrier struck a blow upon them with his hammer, and the crowd groaned, but no more was done. "'What is this decree that the smith spoke of?' Darnay asked the postmaster when he had thanked him and stood beside him in the yard. Truly a decree for selling the property of emigrants. When passed? On the fourteenth. The day I left England. Everybody says it is but one of several, and that there will be others, if there are not already, banishing all emigrants and condemning all to death who return. That is what he meant when he said your life was not your own. But there are no such decrees yet. What do I know? said the postmaster, shrugging his shoulders. There may be, or there will be. It's all the same. What would you have? They rested on some straw in a loft until the middle of the night, then rode forward again when all the town was asleep. Among the many wild changes observable on familiar things, which made this wild ride unreal, not the least was the seeming rarity of sleep. After long and lonely spurring over dreary roads, they would come to a cluster of poor cottages, not steeped in darkness, but all glittering with lights, and would find the people in a ghostly manner in the dead of the night, circling hand in hand round a shriveled tree of liberty, or all drawn up together singing a liberty song. Happily, however, there was sleep in Beauvais that night to help them out of it, and they passed once more into solitude and loneliness. Jiggling through the untimely cold and wet, among impoverished fields that had yielded no fruits of the earth that year, diversified by the blackened remains of burnt houses, and by the sudden emergence from ambuscade, and sharp reining up against their way, of patriot patrols on the watch on all the roads. Daylight at last found them before the wall of Paris. The barrier was closed and strongly guarded when they rode up to it. "'Where are the papers of this prisoner?' demanded a resolute-looking man in authority, who was summoned out by the guard. Naturally struck by the disagreeable word, Charles Darnay requested the speaker to take notice that he was a free traveller and French citizen, in charge of an escort which the disturbed state of the country had imposed upon him, and which he had paid for. Where, repeated the same personage, without taking any heed of him whatever, are the papers of this prisoner? The drunken patriot had them in his cap and produced them. Casting his eyes over Gabelle's letter, the same personage in authority showed some disorder and surprise, and looked at Darnay with a close attention. He left escort and escorted without saying a word, however, and went into the guard-room. Meanwhile they sat upon their horses outside the gate. Looking about him while in this state of suspense, Charles Darnay observed that the gate was held by a mixed guard of soldiers and patriots the latter far outnumbering the former, and that while ingress into the city for peasants' carts bringing in supplies and for similar traffic and traffickers was easy enough, egress even for the homeliest people was very difficult. A numerous medley of men and women, not to mention beasts and vehicles of various sorts, was waiting to issue forth, but the previous identification was so strict that they filtered through the barrier very slowly. Some of these people knew their turn for examination to be so far off that they lay down on the ground to sleep or smoke, while others talked together or loitered about. The red cap and tricolour cockade were universal, both among men and women. When he had sat in his saddle some half-hour, taking note of these things, Darnay found himself confronted by the same man in authority who directed the guard to open the barrier. Then he delivered to the escort, drunk and sober, a receipt for the escorted, and requested him to dismount. He did so, and the two patriots, leading his tired horse, turned and rode away without entering the city. 
He accompanied his conductor into a guard-room, smelling of common wine and tobacco, where certain soldiers and patriots, asleep and awake, drunk and sober, and in various neutral states between sleeping and waking, drunkenness and sobriety, were standing and lying about. The light in the guard-house, half derived from the waning oil-lamps of the night, and half from the overcast day, was in a correspondingly uncertain condition. Some registers were lying open on a desk, and an officer of a coarse, dark aspect presided over these. "'Citizen Defarge,' said he to Darnay's conductor, as he took a slip of paper to write on, "'is this the emigrant Evremond? This is the man. Your age, Evremond? Thirty-seven. Married, Evremond? Yes. Where married? In England. Without doubt. Where is your wife, Evremond? In England. Without doubt. You are consigned, Evremond, to the prison of La Force. Just heaven, exclaimed Darnay, under what law and for what offence? The officer looked up from his slip of paper for a moment. We have new laws, Evremond, and new offences since you were here. He said it with a hard smile and went on writing. I entreat you to observe that I have come here voluntarily, in response to that written appeal of a fellow countryman which lies before you. I demand no more than the opportunity to do so without delay. Is not that my right? Emigrants have no rights, Evremond, was the stolid reply. The officer wrote until he had finished, read over to himself what he had written, sanded it and handed it to Defarge, with the words, In secret. Defarge motioned with the paper to the prisoner that he must accompany him. The prisoner obeyed, and a guard of two armed patriots attended them. Is it you, said Defarge, in a low voice, as they went down the guardhouse steps and turned into Paris, who married the daughter of Dr. Manette, once a prisoner in the Bastille that is no more? Yes, replied Darnay, looking at him with surprise. My name is Defarge, and I keep a wine shop in the quarter St. Antoine. Possibly you have heard of me. My wife came to your house to reclaim her father? Yes. The word wife seemed to serve as a gloomy reminder to Defarge, to say with sudden impatience, in the name of that sharp female newly born, and called La Guillotine, why did you come to France? You heard me say why a minute ago. Do you not believe it is the truth? A bad truth for you, said Defarge, speaking with knitted brows, and looking straight before him. Indeed I am lost here. All here is so unprecedented, so changed, so sudden and unfair that I am absolutely lost. Will you render me a little help? None. Defarge spoke, always looking straight before him. Will you answer me a single question? Perhaps, according to its nature, you can say what it is. In this prison that I am going to so unjustly, shall I have some free communication with the world outside? You will see. I am not to be buried there, prejudged, and without any means of presenting my case? You will see. But what then? Other people have been similarly buried in worse prisons before now. But never by me, citizen Defarge. Defarge glanced darkly at him for answer, and walked on in a steady and set silence. The deeper he sank into this silence, the fainter hope there was, or so Darnay thought, of his softening in any slight degree. He therefore made haste to say, It is of the utmost importance to me, you know, citizen, even better than I, of how much importance, that I should be able to communicate to Mr. Lorry of Telson's Bank, an English gentleman who is now in Paris, the simple fact without comment that I have been thrown into the prison of La Force. Will you cause that to be done for me? I will do, Defarge doggedly rejoined, nothing for you. My duty is to my country and the people. I am the sworn servant of both, against you. I will do nothing for you. Charles Darnay felt it hopeless to entreat him further, and his pride was touched besides. As they walked on in silence, he could not but see how used the people were to the spectacle of prisoners passing along the streets. The very children scarcely noticed him. A few passers turned their heads, and a few shook their fingers at him, as an aristocrat, Otherwise, that a man in good clothes should be going to prison was no more remarkable than that a laborer in working clothes should be going to work. In one narrow, dark, and dirty street through which they passed, 
an excited orator mounted on a stool was addressing the excited audience on the crimes against the people of the king and the royal family. The next few words that he caught from this man's lips first made it known to Charles Darnay that the king was in prison and that the foreign ambassadors had one and all left Paris. On the road, except at Beauvais, he had heard absolutely nothing. The escort and the universal watchfulness had completely isolated him. That he had fallen among far greater dangers than those which had developed themselves when he left England, he of course knew now. That perils had thickened about him fast, and might thicken faster and faster yet, he of course knew now. He could not but admit to himself that he might not have made this journey if he could have foreseen the events of a few days, and yet his misgivings were not so dark as, imagined by the light of this later time, they would appear. Troubled as the future was, it was the unknown future, and in its obscurity there was ignorant hope. The horrible massacre, days and nights long, which within a few rounds of the clock was to set a great mark of blood upon the blessed garnering time of harvest, was as far out of his knowledge as if it had been a hundred thousand years away. The sharp female newly born and called la guillotine was hardly known to him or to the generality of people by name. The frightful deeds that were to be soon done were probably unimagined at that time in the brains of the doers. How could they have a place in the shadowy conceptions of a gentle mind? Of unjust treatment and detention and hardship, and in cruel separation from his wife and child, he foreshadowed the likelihood, or the certainty, but beyond this he dreaded nothing distinctly. With this on his mind, which was enough to carry into a dreary prison courtyard, he arrived at the prison of La Force. A man with a bloated face opened the strong wicket, to whom Defarge presented, the emigrant Evremond. "'What the devil? How many more of them?' exclaimed the man with the bloated face. Defarge took his receipt without noticing the exclamation, and withdrew, with his two fellow patriots. "'What the devil, I say again!' exclaimed the jailer, left with his wife. "'How many more?' The jailer's wife, being provided with no answer to the question, merely replied, "'One must have patience, my dear.' Three turnkeys who entered, responsive to a bell she rang, echoed the sentiment, and one added, For the love of liberty, which sounded in that place like an inappropriate conclusion. The prison of La Force was a gloomy prison, dark and filthy, and with a horrible smell of foul sleep in it. Extraordinary how soon the noisome flavor of imprisoned sleep becomes manifest in all such places that are ill cared for. In secret, too, grumbled the jailer, looking at the written paper, as if I was not already full to bursting. He stuck the paper on a file in an ill humour, and Charles Darnay awaited his further pleasure for half an hour, sometimes pacing to and fro in the strong arched room, sometimes resting on a stone seat, and in either case detained to be imprinted at, on the memory of the chief and his subordinates. Come, said the chief, at length taking up his keys. Come with me, emigrant. Through the dismal prison twilight, his new charge accompanied him by corridor and staircase, many doors clanging and locking behind them, until they came into a large, low, vaulted chamber, crowded with prisoners of both sexes. The women were seated at a long table, reading and writing, knitting, sewing, and embroidering. The men were for the most part standing behind their chairs, or lingering up and down the room. In the instinctive association of prisoners with shameful crime and disgrace, the newcomer recoiled from this company. But the crowning unreality of his long unreal ride was, there all at once rising to receive him, with every refinement of manner known to the time, and with all the engaging graces and courtesies of life. So strangely clouded were these refinements of the prison manners and gloom, so spectral did they become in the inappropriate squalor and misery through which they were seen, that Charles Darnay seemed to stand in a company of the dead. Ghosts all! The ghost of beauty, the ghost of stateliness, the ghost of elegance, the ghost of pride, the ghost of frivolity, the ghost of wit, the ghost of youth, the ghost of age, all waiting their dismissal from the desolate shore, all turning on him eyes that were changed by the death they had died in coming here. It struck him motionless, 
the jailer standing at his side and the other jailers moving about, who would have been well enough as to appearance in the ordinary exercise of their functions, looked so extravagantly coarse, contrasted with sorrowing mothers and blooming daughters who were there, with the apparitions of the coquette, the young beauty, and the mature woman delicately bred, that the inversion of all experience and likelihood which the scene of shadows presented was heightened to its utmost. Surely ghosts all! Surely the long unreal ride some progress of disease that had brought him to these gloomy shades! In the name of the assembled companions in misfortune, said a gentleman of courtly appearance and address, coming forward, I have the honour of giving you welcome to La Force, and of condoling with you on the calamity that has brought you among us. May it soon terminate happily. It would be an impertinence elsewhere, but it is not so here, to ask your name and condition. Charles Darnay roused himself, and gave the required information, in words as suitable as he could find. But I hope, said the gentleman, following the chief jailer with his eyes, who moved across the room, that you are not in secret. I do not understand the meaning of the term, but I have heard them say so. Oh, what a pity! We so much regret it. But take courage. Several members of our society have been in secret at first, and it has lasted but a short time. Then he added, raising his voice, I grieve to inform the society, in secret. There was a murmur of commiseration as Charles Darnay crossed the room to a grated door where the jailer waited him, and many voices, among which the soft and compassionate voices of women were conspicuous, gave him good wishes and encouragement. He turned at the grated door to render the thanks of his heart. It closed under the jailer's hand, and the apparitions vanished from his sight forever. The wicket opened on a stone staircase leading upward. When they had ascended forty steps, the prisoner of half an hour already counted them. The jailer opened a low black door, and they passed into a solitary cell. It struck cold and damp, but was not dark. Yours, said the jailer. Why am I confined alone? How do I know? I can buy pen, ink, and paper? Such are not my orders. You will be visited and can ask then. At present you may buy your food and nothing more. There were in the cell a chair, a table, and a straw mattress. As the jailer made a general inspection of these objects, and of the four walls before going out, a wandering fancy wandered through the mind of the prisoner leaning against the wall opposite to him, that the jailer was so unwholesomely bloated, both in face and person, as to look like a man who'd been drowned and filled with water. When the jailer was gone, he thought in the same wandering away, now am I left as if I were dead? Stopping then to look down at the mattress, he turned from it with a sick feeling, and thought, and here in these crawling creatures is the first condition of the body after death. Five paces by four and a half, five paces by four and a half, five paces by four and a half. The prisoner walked to and fro in his cell, counting its measurement, and the roar of the city arose like muffled drums, with a wild swell of voices added to them. He made shoes. He made shoes. He made shoes. The prisoner counted the measurement again and paced faster, to draw his mind from him, that latter repetition. The ghosts that vanished him, the wicket closed. There was one among them, the appearance of a lady dressed in black, who was leaning in the embrasure of a window, and she had a light shining upon her golden hair, and she looked like, let us ride on again, for God's sake, through the illuminated villages, with the people all awake. He made shoes. He made shoes. He made shoes. Five paces by four and a half. With such scraps, tossing and rolling upward from the depths of his mind, the prisoner walked faster and faster, obstinately counting and counting, and the roar of the city changed to this extent that he knew in the swell that rose above them. End of In Secret This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens Book the Third 
The Track of a Storm. Chapter 2. The Grindstone. Tellson's Bank, established in the Saint-Germain quarter of Paris, was in a wing of a large house, approached by a courtyard, and shut off from the street by a high wall and a strong gate. The house belonged to a great nobleman who had lived in it until he made a flight from the troubles, in his own cook's dress, and got across the borders. A mere beast of the chase flying from hunters, he was still in his metempsychosis no other than the same Monsignor, the preparation of whose chocolate for whose lips had once occupied three strong men besides the cook in question. Monsignor gone, and the three strong men absolving themselves from the sin of having drawn his high wages, by being more than ready and willing to cut his throat on the altar of the dawning republic, one and indivisible, of liberty, equality, fraternity or death, Monsignor's house had been first sequestrated, and then confiscated. For all things moved so fast, and decree followed decree with that fierce precipitation, that now unto the third night of the autumn month of September, patriot emissaries of the law were in possession of the Monsignor's house, and had marked it with the tricolor, and were drinking brandy in its state apartments. A place of business in London, like Tellson's place of business in Paris, would soon have driven the house out of its mind and into the Gazette. For, what would staid British responsibility and respectability have said to orange trees and boxes in a bank courtyard, and even to a cupid over the counter? Yet such things were. Tellson's had whitewashed the cupid, but he was still to be seen on the ceiling, in the coolest linen, aiming, as he very often does, at money from morning to night. Bankruptcy must inevitably have come of this young pagan, in Lombard Street, London, and also of a curtained alcove in the rear of the immortal boy, and also of a looking-glass let into the wall, and also of clerks, not at all old, who danced in public on the slightest provocation. Yet, a French Telsons could get on with these things exceedingly well, and, as long as the times held together, no man had taken fright at them and drawn out his money. What money would be drawn out of Telson's henceforth, and what would lie there, lost and forgotten? What plate and jewels would tarnish in Telson's hiding places, while the depositors rusted in prisons, and when they should have violently perished, how many accounts with Telson's never to be balanced in this world must be carried over into the next? No man could have said, that night, any more than Mr. Jarvis Lorry could, though he thought heavily of these questions. He sat by a newly lighted wood fire, the blighted and unfruitful year was prematurely cold, and on his honest and courageous face there was a deeper shade than the pendant lamp could throw, or any object in the room distortedly reflect. A shade of horror. He occupied rooms in the bank, in his fidelity to the house of which he had grown to be a part, like a strong root ivy. It chanced that they derived a kind of security from the patriotic occupation of the main building, but the true-hearted old gentleman never calculated about that. All such circumstances were indifferent to him, so that he did his duty. On the opposite side of the courtyard, under a colonnade, was extensive standing, for carriages, where, indeed, some carriages of Monseigneur yet stood. Against two of the pillars were fastened two great flaring flambeaux, and in the light of these, standing out in the open air, was a large grindstone a roughly mounted thing which appeared to have been hurriedly brought there from some neighboring smithy or other workshop. Rising and looking out of the window at these harmless objects, Mr. Lorry shivered and retired to his seat by the fire. He had opened not only the glass window, but the lattice blind outside it, and he had closed them both again, and he shivered through his frame. From the streets beyond the high wall and the strong gate, there came the usual night hum of the city, with now and then an indescribable ring in it, weird and unearthly, as if some unwanted sound of a terrible nature were going up to heaven. "'Thank God,' said Mr. Lorry, clasping his hands, "'that no one near and dearer to me is in this dreadful town to-night. May he have mercy on all who are in danger.' Soon afterwards the bell at the great gate sounded, and he thought, "'They have come back and sat listening.' But there was no loud eruption into the courtyard as he had expected, and he heard the gate clash again, and all was quiet. The nervousness and dread that were upon him inspired that vague uneasiness respecting the bank, which a great change would naturally awaken, with such feelings aroused. 
It was well guarded, and he got up to go among the trusty people who were watching it, when his door suddenly opened, and two figures rushed in, at the sight of which he fell back in amazement. Lucy and her father. Lucy, with her arms stretched out to him, and with that old look of earnestness so concentrated and intensified, that it seemed as though it had been stamped upon her face expressly to give force and power to it at this one passage of her life. "'What is this?' cried Mr. Lorry, breathless and confused. "'What is the matter? Lucy! Manette! What has happened? What has brought you here? What is it?' With the look fixed upon him, in her paleness and wildness, she panted out in his arms imploringly, "'Oh, my dear friend, my husband!' "'Your husband, Lucy?' "'Charles!' "'What of Charles?' "'Here!' "'Here, in Paris? Has been here some days, three or four, I don't know how many. I can't collect my thoughts. An errand of generosity brought him here unknown to us. He was stopped at the barrier and sent to prison.' The old man uttered an irrepressible cry. Almost at the same moment the beg of the great gate rang again, and a loud noise of feet and voices came pouring into the courtyard. "'What is that noise?' said the doctor, turning towards the window. "'Don't look!' cried Mr. Lorry. "'Don't look out, Manette. For your life, don't touch the blind.' The doctor turned, with his hand upon the fastening of the window, and said, with a cool, bold smile, "'My dear friend,' I have a charmed life in this city. I have been a Bastille prisoner. There is no patriot in Paris, in Paris, in France, who, knowing me to have been a prisoner in the Bastille, would touch me, except to overwhelm me with embraces, or carry me in triumph. My old pain has given me a power that has brought us through the barrier, and gained us news of Charles there, and brought us here. I knew it would be so. I knew I could help Charles out of all danger. I told Lucy so. "'What is that noise?' His hand was again upon the window. "'Don't look!' cried Mr. Lorry, absolutely desperate. "'No, Lucy, my dear, nor you.' He got his arm round her and held her. "'Don't be so terrified, my love. I solemnly swear to you that I know of no harm having happened to Charles, that I had no suspicion, even, of his being in this fatal place. What prison is he in?' "'La Fosse. "'La Fosse. "'Lucy, my child, if ever you were brave and serviceable in your life, and you were always both, you will compose yourself now to do exactly as I bid you, for more depends upon it than you can think or I can say. There is no help for you in any action on your part tonight. You cannot possibly stir out. I say this because what I must bid you to do for Charles's sake is the hardest thing to do of all. You must instantly be obedient, still, and quiet. You must let me put you in a room at the back here. You must leave your father and me alone for two minutes, and as there are life and death in the world, you must not delay. I will be submissive to you. I see in your face that you know I can do nothing else than this. I know you are true." The old man kissed her and hurried her into his room and turned the key. Then came hurrying back to the doctor and opened the window and partly opened the blind and put his hand upon the doctor's arm and looked out with him into the courtyard looked out upon a throng of men and women, not enough in number, or near enough, to fill the courtyard, not more than forty or fifty in all. The people in possession of the house had let them in at the gate, and they had rushed in to work at the grindstone. It had evidently been set up there for their purpose, as in a convenient and retired spot. But such awful workers, and such awful work! The grindstone had a double handle, and turning at it madly were two men, whose faces, as their long hair flapped back when the whirlings of the grindstone brought their faces up, were more horrible and cruel than the visages of the wildest savages in their most barbarous disguise. False eyebrows and false moustaches were upon them, and their hideous countenances were all bloody and sweaty, and all awry with howling, and all staring and glaring with beastly excitement and want of sleep. As these ruffians turned and turned, their matted locks now flung forward over their eyes, now flung backward over their necks, some women held wine to their mouths that they might drink, and what with dropping blood, and what with dropping wine, and what with the stream of sparks struck out of the stone, all their wicked atmosphere seemed gore and fire. The eye could not detect one creature in the group free from the smear of blood. 
shouldering one another to get next at the sharpening stone, were men stripped to the waist, with the stain all over their limbs and bodies, men in all sorts of rags, with the stain upon those rags, men devilishly set off with spoils of women's lace and silk and ribbon, with the stain dyeing those trifles through and through. Hatchets, knives, bayonets, swords, all brought to be sharpened, were all red with it. Some of the hacked swords were tied to the wrists of those who carried them, with strips of linen and fragments of dress, ligatures various in kind, but all deep of the one color. And as the frantic wielders of these weapons snatched them from the stream of sparks and tore away into the streets, the same red hue was red in their frenzied eyes, eyes which any unbrutalized beholder would have given twenty years of life to petrified with a well-directed gun. All this was seen in a moment, as the vision of a drowning man, or of any human creature at any very great pass, could see a world if it were there. They drew back from the window, and the doctor looked for explanation in his friend's ashy face. "'They are,' Mr. Lorry whispered the words, glancing fearfully round at the locked room, "'murdering the prisoners. If you are sure of what you say, if you really have the power you think you have, as I believe you have, make yourself known to these devils, and get taken to La Fosse. It may be too late, I don't know, but let it not be a minute later. Dr. Manette pressed his hand, hastened bareheaded out of the room, and was in the courtyard when Mr. Lorry regained the blind. His streaming white hair, his remarkable face, and the impetuous confidence of his manner as he put the weapons aside like water, carried him in an instant to the heart of the concourse at the stone. For a few moments there was a pause, and a hurry, and a murmur, and the unintelligible sound of his voice, and then Mr. Lorry saw him, surrounded by all, and in the midst of a line of twenty men long, all linked shoulder to shoulder and hand to shoulder, hurried out with cries of, Live the Bastille prisoner! Help for the Bastille prisoners kindred in La Force! Room for the Bastille prisoner in front there! Save the prisoner Evremond at La Force! And a thousand answering shouts. He closed the lattice again with a fluttering heart, closed the window and the curtain, hastened to Lucy, and told her that her father was assisted by the people and gone in search of her husband. He found her child and Miss Pross with her, but it never occurred to him to be surprised by their appearance until a long time afterwards, when he sat watching them in such quiet as the night knew. Lucy had, by that time, fallen into a stupor on the floor at his feet, clinging to his hand. Miss Pross had laid the child down on his own bed, and her head had gradually fallen on the pillow beside her pretty charge. Oh, the long, long night, with the moans of the poor wife! And oh, the long, long night, with no return of her father, and no tidings! Twice more in the darkness the bell at the great gate sounded, and the eruption was repeated, and the grindstone whirled and spluttered. "'What is it?' cried Lucy, affrighted. "'Hush! The soldiers' swords are sharpened there,' said Mr. Lorry. "'The place is national property now, and used as a kind of armory, my love.' Twice more in all, but the last spell of work was feeble and fitful. Soon afterwards the day began to dawn, and he softly detached himself from the clasping hand, and cautiously looked out again. A man, so besmeared that he might have been a sorely wounded soldier creeping back to consciousness on a field of slain, was rising from the pavement by the side of the grindstone, and looking about him with a vacant air. Shortly this worn-out murderer descried in the imperfect light one of the carriages of Monseigneur, and staggering to that gorgeous vehicle, climbed in at the door, and shut himself up to take his rest on its dainty cushions. The great grindstone earth had turned when Mr. Lorry looked out again, and the sun was red in the courtyard. But the lesser grindstone stood alone there in the calm morning air, with a red upon it that the sun had never given, and would never take away. End of Chapter 2 The Grindstone Book the Third The Track of a Storm Read by Tora in Yellowstone National Park, October 2006. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. L I B R I V O X dot O R G. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book the Third, 
the track of a storm? Chapter 3. The Shadow One of the first considerations which arose in the business mind of Mr. Lorry when business hours came around was this, that he had no right to imperil Telson's by sheltering the wife of an immigrant prisoner under the bank roof. His own possessions, safety, life, he would have hazarded for Lucy and her child, without a moment's demur. But the great trust he held was not his own, and as to that business charge, he was a strict man of business. At first his mind reverted to Defarge, and he thought of finding out the wine shop again, and taking counsel with its master in reference to the safest dwelling place in the distracted state of the city. But the same consideration that suggested him repudiated him. He lived in the most violent quarter, and doubtless was influential there, and deep in its dangerous workings. Noon coming, and the doctor not returning, and every minute's delay tending to compromise Telson's. Mr. Lorry advised with Lucy. She said that her father had spoken of hiring a lodging for a short term in that quarter, near the banking house. As there was no business objection to this, and as he foresaw that even if it were is all well with Charles, and he were to be released, he could not hope to leave the city. Mr. Lorry went out in quest of such a lodging, and found a suitable one, high up in a removed by street, where the closed blinds and all the other windows of a high melancholy square of buildings marked deserted homes. To this lodging he at once removed Lucy and her child and Miss Pross, giving them what comfort he could, and much more than he had himself. He left Jerry with them as a figure to fill a doorway that would bear considerable knocking on the head and retain to his own occupations. A disturbed and doleful mind he brought to bear upon them, and slowly and heavily the day lagged on with him. It wore itself out, and wore him out with it, until the bank closed. He was again alone in his room of the previous night, considering what to do next, when he heard a foot upon the stair. In a few moments a man stood in his presence, who, with a keenly observant look at him, addressed him by his name. Your servant, said Mr. Lorry, do you know me? He was a strongly made man, with dark curling hair, from forty-five to fifty years of age. For answer he repeated, without any change of emphasis, the words, Do you know me? I've seen you somewhere, perhaps at my wine shop. Much interested and agitated, Mr. Lorry said, You come from Dr. Manet. Yes, I come from Dr. Manet. And what says he? What does he send me? Defarge gave into his anxious hand an open scrap of paper, bore the words in the doctor's writing. Charles is safe, but I cannot safely leave this place yet. I have obtained the favor that the bearer has a short note from Charles to his wife. Let the bearer see his wife. It was dated from La Force within an hour. Will you accompany me, said Mr. Lorry, joyfully relieved after reading this note aloud, to where his wife resides? Yes, returned Defarge. Scarcely noticing as yet in what a curiously reserved and mechanical way Defarge spoke, Mr. Lorry put on his hat, and they went down into the courtyard. There they found two women, one knitting, Madame Defarge, surely, said Mr. Lorry, who had left her in exactly the same attitude some seventeen years ago. It is she, observed her husband. Does Madame go with us? inquired Mr. Lorry, seeing that she moved as they moved. Yes, that she may be able to recognize the faces and know the persons. It is for their safety. Beginning to be struck by Defarge's manner, Mr. Lorry looked dubiously at him, and led the way. Both the women followed, the second woman being the vengeance. They passed through the intervening streets as quickly as they might, ascended the staircase of the new domicile, where, admitted by Jerry, 
and found Lucy weeping alone. She was thrown into a transport by the tidings Mr. Lorry gave her of her husband and clasped the hand that delivered his note, little thinking what it had been doing near him in the night, and might, but for a chance, have done to him. Dearest, take courage, I am well, and your father has influence around me. You cannot answer this. Kiss our child for me. That was all the writing. There was so much, however, to her who received it, that she turned from Defarge to his wife and kissed one of the hands that knitted. It was a passionate, loving, thankful, womanly action, but the hand made no response, dropped cold and heavy and took to its knitting again. There was something in its touch that gave Lucy a check. She stopped in the act of putting the note in her bosom and, with her hands yet at her neck, looked terrified at Madame Defarge. Madame Defarge met the lifted eyebrows and forehead with a cold, impassive stare. My dear, said Mr. Lorry, striking in to explain, there are frequent risings in the streets, and although it is not likely they will ever trouble you, Madame Defarge wishes to see those whom she has the power to protect at such times, to the end that she may know them, that she may identify them, I believe said Mr. Lorry, rather halting in his reassuring words as the stony manner of all the three impressed itself upon him more and more. I state the case, citizen Defarge. Defarge looked gloomily at his wife and gave no other answer than a gruff sound of acquiescence. You had better, Lucy, said Mr. Lorry, doing all he could to propitiate by tone and manner. Have the dear child here, and our good pros, our good pros, Defarge, is an English lady, and knows no French. The lady in question, whose rooted conviction that she was more than a match for any foreigner was not to be shaken by distress and danger, appeared with folded arms and observed in English, to the vengeance whom her eyes first encountered. Well, I am sure, bold face, I hope, you, are pretty well. She also bestowed a British cough on Madame Defarge, but neither of the two took much heed of her. Is this his child? said Madame Defarge, stopping in her work for the first time, and pointing her knitting needle at little Lucy as if it were the finger of fate. Yes, madame, answered Mr. Lorry, this is our poor prisoner's darling daughter and only child. The shadow attendant on Madame Defarge and her party seemed to fall so threatening and dark on the child that her mother instinctively kneeled on the ground beside her and held her to her breast. The shadow attendant on Madame Defarge and her party seemed then to fall threatening and dark on both the mother and the child. It is enough, my husband, said Madame Defarge. I have seen them. We may go. But the suppressed manner had enough of menace in it, not visible and presented, but indistinct and withheld, to alarm Lucy into saying, as she laid her appealing hand on Madame Defarge's dress, You'll be good to my poor husband. You'll do him no harm. You will help me to see him if you can. Your husband is not my business here, returned Madame Defarge, looking down at her with perfect composure. It is the daughter of your father who is my business here. For my sake, then, be merciful to my husband, for my child's sake. She will put her hands together and pray you to be merciful. We are more afraid of you than any of these others. Madame Defarge received it as a compliment and looked at her husband. Defarge, who had been uneasily biting his thumbnail and looking at her, collected his face into a sterner expression. What is it that your husband says in that little letter? asked Madame Defarge with a lowering smile. Influence? He says something touching influence. That my father, said Lucy hurriedly taking the paper from her breast, but with her alarmed eyes on her questioner and not on it, has much influence around him. Surely it will release him, said Madame Defarge. Let it do so. 
As a wife and mother, cried Lucy most earnestly, I implore you to have pity on me, and not to exercise any power that you possess against my innocent husband, but to use it in his behalf. O oh, sister woman, think of me as a wife and mother. Madame de Fage looked coldly as ever at the suppliant, and said, turning to her friend, the vengeance. The wives and mothers we have been used to see since we were as little as this child, and much less, have not been greatly considered. We have known their husbands and fathers laid in prison and kept from them often enough. All our lives we have seen our sister women suffer, in themselves and in their children, poverty, nakedness, hunger, thirst, sickness, misery, oppression, and neglect of all kinds? We have seen nothing else return the vengeance. We have borne this a long time, said Madame Defarge, turning her eyes upon Lucy. Judge you, is it likely that the trouble of one wife and mother would be much to us now? She resumed her knitting and went out. The vengeance followed. Defarge went last and closed the door. Courage, my dear Lucy, said Mr. Lorry as he raised her. Courage, courage. So far all goes well with us. Much, much better than it has of late gone with many poor souls. Cheer up and have a thankful heart. I am not thankless. I hope, but that dreadful woman seems to throw a shadow on me and all my hopes. Tut, tut, said Mr. Lorry. What is this despondency in the brave little breast? A shadow indeed. No substance in it, Lucy. But the shadow of the manner of these defarges was dark upon himself. For all that, and in his secret mind, it troubled him greatly. End of chapter 3 The Shadow Book the Third, The Track of a Storm This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Minter A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens Book Three Chapter Four Calm in storm. Dr. Manette did not return until the morning of the fourth day of his absence. So much of what had happened in that dreadful time as could be kept from the knowledge of Lucy was so well concealed from her that not until long afterwards, when France and she were far apart, did she know that eleven hundred defenceless prisoners of both sexes and all ages had been killed by the populace that four days and nights had been darkened by this deed of horror, and that the air around her had been tainted by the slain. She only knew that there had been an attack upon the prison, that all political prisoners had been in danger, and that some had been dragged out by the crowd and murdered. To Mr. Lorry the doctor communicated, under an injunction of secrecy on which he had no need to dwell, that the crowd had taken him through a scene of carnage to the prison of La Force, that in the prison he had found a self-appointed tribunal sitting, before which the prisoners were brought singly, and by which they were rapidly ordered to be put forth to be massacred, or to be released, or, in a few cases, to be sent back to their cells, that, presented by his conductors to this tribunal, he had announced himself by name and profession as having been for eighteen years a secret and unaccused prisoner in the Bastille, that one of the bodies so sitting in judgment had risen and identified him, and that this man was Defarge. That hereupon he had ascertained, through the registers on the table, that his son-in-law was among the living prisoners, and had pleaded hard to the tribunal, of whom some members were asleep and some awake, some dirty with murder and some clean, some sober and some not, for his life and liberty. 
that in the first frantic greetings lavished on himself as a notable sufferer under the overthrown system, it had been accorded to him to have Charles Darnay brought before the lawless court and examined, that he seemed on the point of being at once released, when the tide in his favour met with some unexplained check, not intelligible to the doctor, which led to a few words of secret conference, that the man sitting as president had then informed Dr. Manette that the prisoner must remain in custody, but should, for his sake, be held inviolate in safe custody. That immediately, on a signal, the prisoner was removed to the interior of the prison again, but that he, the doctor, had then so strongly pleaded for permission to remain and assure himself that his son-in-law was, through no malice or mischance, delivered to the concourse, whose murderous yells outside the gate had often drowned the proceedings, that he had obtained the permission, and had remained in that hall of blood until the danger was over. The sights he had seen there, with brief snatches of food and sleep by intervals, shall remain untold. The mad joy over the prisoners who were saved has astounded him scarcely less than the mad ferocity against those who were cut to pieces. One prisoner there was, he said, who had been discharged into the street free, but at whom a mistaken savage had thrust a pike as he passed out. Being besought to go to him and dress the wound, the doctor had passed out at the same gate, and had found him in the arms of a company of Samaritans who were seated on the bodies of their victims. With an inconsistency as monstrous as anything in this awful nightmare, they had helped the healer, and tended the wounded man with the gentlest solicitude, had made a litter for him, and escorted him carefully from the spot, had then caught up their weapons, and plunged anew into a butchery so dreadful that the doctor had covered his eyes with his hands, and swooned away in the midst of it. As Mr. Lorry received these confidences, and as he watched the face of his friend, now sixty-two years of age, a misgiving arose within him that such dread experiences would revive the old danger. But he had never seen his friend in his present aspect. He had never at all known him in his present character. For the first time the doctor felt, now, that his suffering was strength and power. For the first time he felt that in that sharp fire he had slowly forged the iron which could break the prison door of his daughter's husband and deliver him. It all tended to a good end, my friend. It was not mere waste and ruin. As my beloved child was helpful in restoring me to myself, I will be helpful now in restoring the dearest part of herself to her. By the aid of heaven, I will do it. Thus, Dr. Manette. And when Jarvis Lorry saw the kindled eyes, the resolute face, the calm, strong look and bearing of a man whose life always seemed to him to have been stopped like a clock for so many years, and then set going again with an energy which had lain dormant during the cessation of its usefulness, he believed. Greater things than the doctor had at that time to contend with would have yielded before his persevering purpose— while he kept himself in his place as a physician, whose business was with all degrees of mankind, bond and free, rich and poor, bad and good, he used his personal influence so wisely that he was soon the inspecting physician of three prisons, and among them of La Force. He could now assure Lucy that her husband was no longer confined alone, but was mixed with the general body of prisoners. He saw her husband weakly, and brought sweet messages to her, straight from his lips. Sometimes her husband himself sent a letter to her, though never by the doctor's hand. But she was not permitted to write to him, for among the many wild suspicions of plots in the prisons, the wildest of all pointed at emigrants who were known to have made friends or permanent connections abroad. This new life of the doctor's was an anxious life, no doubt. Still, the sagacious Mr. Lorry saw that there was a new sustaining pride in it. 
Nothing unbecoming tinged the pride. It was a natural and worthy one. But he observed it as a curiosity. The doctor knew that up to that time his imprisonment had been associated in the minds of his daughter and his friend with his personal affliction, deprivation, and weakness. Now that this was changed, and he knew himself to be invested through that old trial with forces to which they both looked for Charles's ultimate safety and deliverance, he became so far exalted by the change that he took the lead and direction, and required them as the weak to trust to him as the strong. The preceding relative positions of himself and Lucy were reversed, yet only as the liveliest gratitude and affection could reverse them, for he could have no pride but in rendering some service to her who had rendered so much to him. "'All curious to see,' thought Mr. Lorry, in his amiably shrewd way, "'but all natural and right. So take the lead, my dear friend, and keep it. It couldn't be in better hands.' But, though the doctor tried hard, and never ceased trying, to get Charles Darnay set at liberty, or at least to get him brought to trial, the public current of the time set too strong and fast for him. The new era began. The king was tried, doomed, and beheaded. The republic of liberty, equality, fraternity, or death, declared for victory or death against the world in arms. The black flag waved night and day from the great towers of Notre Dame. Three hundred thousand men, summoned to rise against the tyrants of the earth, rose from all the varying soils of France, as if the dragon's teeth had been sown broadcast, and had yielded fruit equally on hill and plain, on rock, in gravel and alluvial mud, under the bright sky of the south, and under the clouds of the north, in fell and forest, in the vineyards, and the olive grounds, and among the cropped grass and the stubble of the court, along the fruitful banks of the broad rivers, and in the sand of the seashore. What private solicitude could rear itself against the deluge of year one of liberty, the deluge rising from below, not falling from above, and with the windows of heaven shut, not opened? There was no pause, no pity, no peace, no interval of relenting rest, no measurement of time. Though days and nights circled as regularly as when time was young, and the evening and morning were the first day, other count of time there was none. Hold of it was lost in the raging fever of a nation, as it is in the fever of one patient. Now, breaking the unnatural silence of a whole city, the executioner showed the people the head of the king. And now it seemed, almost in the same breath, the head of his fair wife, which had had eight weary months of imprisoned widowhood and misery to turn it grey. And yet, observing the strange law of contradiction which obtains in all such cases, the time was long while it flamed by so fast. A revolutionary tribunal in the capital, and forty or fifty thousand revolutionary committees all over the land, a law of the suspected, which struck away all security for liberty or life, and delivered over any good and innocent person to any bad and guilty one. Prisons, gorged with people who had committed no offence, and could obtain no hearing. These things became the established order and nature of appointed things, and seemed to be ancient usage before they were many weeks old. Above all, one hideous figure grew as familiar as if it had been before the general gaze from the foundations of the world, the figure of the sharp female called La Guillotine. It was the popular theme for jests. It was the best cure for headache. It infallibly prevented the hair from turning grey. It imparted a peculiar delicacy to the complexion. It was the national razor which shaved close. Who kissed La Guillotine, looked through the little window, and sneezed into the sack. It was the sign of the regeneration of the human race. It superseded the cross. 
Models of it were worn on breasts from which the cross was discarded, and it was bowed down to, and believed in, where the cross was denied. It sheared off heads so many, that it and the ground it most polluted were a rotten red. It was taken to pieces, like a toy puzzle for a young devil, and was put together again when the occasion wanted it. It hushed the eloquent, struck down the powerful, abolished the beautiful and good. Twenty-two friends of high public mark, twenty-one living and one dead. It had lopped the heads off in one morning, in as many minutes. The name of the strong man of old scripture had descended to the chief functionary who worked it, but so armed he was stronger than his namesake, and blinder, and tore away the gates of God's own temple every day. Among these terrors, and the brood belonging to them, the doctor walked with a steady head, confident in his power, cautiously persistent in his end, never doubting that he would save Lucy's husband at last. Yet the current of the time swept by, so strong and deep, and carried the time away so fiercely, that Charles had lain in prison one year and three months, when the doctor was thus steady and confident. So much more wicked and distracted had the revolution grown in that December month, that the rivers of the south were encumbered with the bodies of the violently drowned by night, and prisoners were shot in lines and squares under the southern wintry sun. Still the doctor walked among the terrors with a steady head. No man better known than he in Paris at that day, no man in a stranger situation. Silent, humane, indispensable in hospital and prison, Using his art equally among assassins and victims, he was a man apart. In the exercise of his skill, the appearance and the story of the Bastille captive removed him from all other men. He was not suspected or brought in question any more than if he had indeed been recalled to life some eighteen years before, or were a spirit moving among mortals. End of Book Three Chapter 4 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Minter. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book 3 Chapter 5 The Wood Sawyer one year and three months. During all that time, Lucy was never sure from hour to hour but that the guillotine would strike off her husband's head next day. Every day, through stony streets, the tumbrils now jolted heavily, filled with condemned. Lovely girls, bright women, brown-haired, black-haired and grey, youths, stalwart men and old, gentle-born and peasant-born, all red wine for la guillotine, all daily brought into light from the dark cellars of the loathsome prisons, and carried to her through the streets to slake her devouring thirst. Liberty, equality, fraternity, or death, the last much the easiest to bestow, O guillotine. If the suddenness of her calamity and the whirling wheels of the time, had stunned the doctor's daughter into awaiting the result in idle despair, it would but have been with her as it was with many. But from the hour when she had taken the white head to her fresh young bosom in the garret of St. Antoine, she had been true to her duties. She was truest to them in the season of trial, as all the quietly loyal and good will always be. As soon as they were established in their new residence, and her father had entered on the routine of his avocations, she arranged the little household as exactly as if her husband had been there. Everything had its appointed place and its appointed time. Little Lucy, she taught, as regularly as if they had all been united in their English home. 
the slight devices with which she cheated herself into the show of a belief that they would soon be reunited, the little preparations for his speedy return, the setting aside of his chair and of his books, these, and the solemn prayer at night for one dear prisoner especially, among the many unhappy souls in prison and the shadow of death, were almost the only outspoken reliefs of her heavy mind. She did not greatly alter in appearance. The plain dark dresses, akin to mourning dresses, which she and her child wore, were as neat and as well attended to as the brighter clothes of happy days. She lost her colour, and the old and intent expression was a constant, not an occasional, thing. Otherwise she remained very pretty and comely. Sometimes at night, on kissing her father, she would burst into the grief she had repressed all day, and would say that her sole reliance under heaven was on him. He always resolutely answered, "'Nothing can happen to him without my knowledge, and I know that I can save him, Lucy.' They had not made the round of their changed life many weeks, when her father said to her, on coming home one evening, "'My dear, there is an upper window in the prison, to which Charles can sometimes gain access at three in the afternoon. When he can get to it, which depends on many uncertainties and incidents, he might see you in the street, he thinks, if you stood in a certain place that I can show you. But you will not be able to see him, my poor child, and even if you could, it would be unsafe for you to make a sign of recognition. Oh, show me the place, my father, and I will go there every day. From that time, in all weathers, she waited there two hours. As the clock struck two, she was there, and at four she turned resignedly away. When it was not too wet or inclement for her child to be with her, they went together. At other times she was alone, but she never missed a single day. It was the dark and dirty corner of a small winding street. The hovel of a cutter of wood into lengths for burning was the only house at that end. All else was wall. On the third day of her being there, he noticed her. "'Good day, citizeness. "'Good day, citizen.' This mode of address was now prescribed by decree. It had been established voluntarily some time ago among the more thorough patriots, but was now law for everybody. "'Walking here again, citizeness?' "'You see me, citizen.' The wood sawyer, who was a little man with the redundancy of gesture, he had once been a mender of roads, cast a glance at the prison, pointed at the prison, and putting his ten fingers before his face to represent bars, peeped through them jocosely. "'Wood is not my business,' said he, and went on sawing his wood. Next day he was looking out for her, and accosted her the moment she appeared. "'What? Walking here again, citizeness?' "'Yes, citizen.' "'Oh, a child, too?' "'Your mother, is it not, my little citizeness?' "'Do I say yes, mamma? whispered little Lucy, drawing close to her. "'Yes, dearest.' "'Yes, citizen.' "'Ah, but it's not my business. My work is my business. See, my saw, I call it my little guillotine. "'La, la, 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 and off his head comes.' The billet fell as he spoke, and he threw it into a basket. "'I'll call myself the Samson of the firewood guillotine. See here again. Lou, lou, lou. No, 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 and off her yet comes. Now, child, tickle, tickle, pickle, pickle, and off each yet comes, all the family. Lucy shuddered as he threw two more billets into his basket. But it was impossible to be there while the wood sawyer was at work and not be in his sight. Thenceforth, to secure his good will, she always spoke to him first and often gave him drink-money, which he readily received. 
He was an inquisitive fellow, and sometimes, when she had quite forgotten him in gazing at the prison roof and grates, and in lifting her heart up to her husband, she would come to herself to find him looking at her, with his knee on his bench, and his saw stopped in its work. "'But it's not my business,' he would generally say on those times, and would briskly fall to his sawing again. In all weathers, in the snow and frost of winter, in the bitter winds of spring, in the hot sunshine of summer, in the rains of autumn, and again in the snow and frost of winter, Lucy passed two hours of every day at this place, and every day on leaving it she kissed the prison wall. Her husband saw her, so she learnt from her father. It might be once in five or six times, it might be twice or thrice running, it might be not for a week or a fortnight together. It was enough that he could and did see her when the chances served, and on that possibility she would have waited out the day seven days a week. These occupations brought her round to the December month, wherein her father walked among the terrors with a steady head. On a lightly snowing afternoon she arrived at the usual corner. It was a day of some wild rejoicing and a festival. She had seen the houses as she came along, decorated with little pikes and with little red caps stuck upon them. Also with tricoloured ribbons, also with the standard inscription. Tricoloured letters were the favourite. Republic one and indivisible. Liberty, equality, fraternity, or death. The miserable shop of the wood sawyer was so small that its whole surface furnished very indifferent space for this legend. He had got somebody to scrawl it up for him, however, who had squeezed death in with most inappropriate difficulty. On his housetop he displayed pike and cap, as a good citizen must, and in a window he had stationed his saw, inscribed as his little Sainte Guillotine, for the great sharp female was by that time popularly canonised. His shop was shut, and he was not there, which was a relief to Lucy, and left her quite alone. But he was not far off, for presently she heard a troubled movement, and a shouting coming along which filled her with fear. A moment afterwards, and a throng of people came pouring round the corner by the prison wall, in the midst of whom was the wood-sawyer, hand in hand with the vengeance. There could not be fewer than five hundred people, and they were dancing like five thousand demons. There was no other music than their own singing. They danced to the popular revolution song, keeping a ferocious time that was like a gnashing of teeth in unison. Men and women danced together, women danced together, men danced together, as Hazard had brought them together. At first they were a mere storm of coarse red caps and coarse woollen rags, but as they filled the place and stopped to dance about Lucy, some ghastly apparition of a dance figure gone raving mad arose among them. They advanced, retreated, struck at one another's hands, clutched at one another's heads, spun round alone, caught one another, and spun round in pairs, until many of them dropped. While those were down, the rest linked hand in hand, and all spun round together. Then the ring broke, and in separate rings of two and four they turned and turned, until they all stopped at once, began again, struck, clutched, and tore, and then reversed the spin, and all spun round another way. Suddenly they stopped again, paused, struck out the time afresh, formed into lines the width of the public way, and with their heads low down and their hands high up, swooped, screaming off. No fight could have been half so terrible as this dance. It was so emphatically a fallen sport, a something once innocent delivered over to all devilry, a healthy pastime changed into a means of angering the blood, bewildering the senses, and stealing the heart. Such grace as was visible in it made it the uglier, showing how warped and perverted all things good by nature were become. The maidenly bosom bared to this, the pretty, almost child's head thus distracted, the delicate foot mincing in this slough of blood and dirt, were types of the disjointed time. This was the Carmagnole, 
as it passed, leaving Lucy frightened and bewildered in the doorway of the wood sawyer's house, the feathery snow fell as quietly and lay as white and soft as if it had never been. Oh, my father! for he stood before her when she lifted up the eyes she had momentarily darkened with her hand. Such a cruel, bad sight! I know, my dear, I know, I have seen it many times. Don't be frightened. Not one of them would harm you. I am not frightened for myself, my father. But when I think of my husband, and the mercies of these people— We will set him above their mercies very soon. I left him climbing to the window, and I came to tell you. There is no one here to see. You may kiss your hand towards that highest shelving roof. I do so, father, and I send him my soul with it. You cannot see him, my poor dear. No, father, said Lucy, yearning and weeping as she kissed her hand. No. A footstep in the snow. Madame Defarge. I salute you, citizeness, from the doctor. I salute you, citizen. This in passing, nothing more. Madame Defarge gone, like a shadow over the white road. Give me your arm, my love. Pass from here with an air of cheerfulness and courage, for his sake. That was well done. They had left the spot. It shall not be in vain. Charles is summoned for to-morrow. For to-morrow? There is no time to lose. I am well prepared, but there are precautions to be taken that could not be taken until he was actually summoned before the tribunal. He has not received the notice yet, but I know that he will presently be summoned for to-morrow, and removed to the conciergerie. I have timely information. You are not afraid? She could scarcely answer. I trust in you. Do so, implicitly. Your suspense is nearly ended, my darling. He shall be restored to you within a few hours. I have encompassed him with every protection. I must see Lorry. He stopped. There was a heavy lumbering of wheels within hearing. They both knew too well what it meant. One, two, three. Three tumbrils faring away with their dread loads over the hushing snow. I must see Lorry, the doctor repeated, turning her another way. The staunch old gentleman was still in his trust, had never left it. He and his books were in frequent requisition as to property confiscated and made national. What he could save for the owners, he saved. No better man living to hold fast by what Tellson's had in keeping, and to hold his peace. A murky red and yellow sky, and a rising mist from the Seine, denoted the approach of darkness. It was almost dark when they arrived at the bank. The stately residence of Monseigneur was altogether blighted and deserted. Above a heap of dust and ashes in the court ran the letters, National Property, the Republic One and Indivisible, Liberty, Equality, Fraternity, or Death. Who could that be with Mr. Lorry, the owner of the riding-coat upon the chair, who must not be seen? From whom, newly arrived, did he come out, agitated and surprised, to take his favourite in his arms? To whom did he appear to repeat her faltering words, when, raising his voice and turning his head towards the door of the room from which he had issued, he said, "'Removed to the conciergerie? And summoned for to-morrow?' End of Book Three, Chapter Five This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nocturna A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens Book Three, Chapter Six Triumph. Instantly all the rest fell to dancing, the and the courtyard overflowed five with the judges. Coming. Public prosecutor and determined jury sat every day. Their lists went forth every evening, 
and were read out by the jailers of the various prisons to their prisoners. The standard jailer joke was, Come out and listen to the evening paper, you inside there. Charles Evermond, called Darnay. So at last began the evening paper at La Force. When a name was called, its owner stepped apart into a spot reserved for those who were announced as being thus fatally recorded. Charles Evermond, called Darnay, had reason to know the usage. He had seen hundreds pass away so. His bloated jailer, who wore spectacles to read with, glanced over them to assure himself that he had taken his place, and went through the list, making a similar short pause at each name. There were twenty-three names, but only twenty were responded to, for one of the prisoners so summoned had died in jail and been forgotten, and two had already been guillotined and forgotten. The list was read in the vaulted chamber where Darnay had seen the associated prisoners on the night of his arrival. Every one of those had perished in the massacre. Every human creature he had since cared for and parted with had died on the scaffold. There were hurried words of farewell and kindness, but the parting was soon over. It was the incident of every day, and the society of La Force was engaged in the preparation of some games of forfeits and a little concert for that evening. They crowded to the grates and shed tears there, but twenty places in the projected entertainments had to be refilled, and the time was, at best, short to the lock-up hour, when the common rooms and corridors would be delivered over to the great dogs who kept watch there through the night. The prisoners were far from insensible or unfeeling. Their ways arose out of the condition of the time. Similarly, though with a subtle difference, a species of fervor or intoxication known without doubt to have led some persons to brave the guillotine unnecessarily and to die by it, was not mere boastfulness, but a wild infection of the wildly shaken public mind. In seasons of pestilence, some of us will have a secret attraction to the disease, a terrible passing inclination to die of it. And all of us have like wonders hidden in our breasts, only needing circumstance to evoke them. The passage to the conciergerie was short and dark. The night in its vermin-haunted cells was long and cold. Next day, fifteen prisoners were put to the bar before Charles Darnay's name was called. All the fifteen were condemned, and the trials of the whole occupied an hour and a half. Charles Evermond, called Darnay, was at length arraigned. His judges sat upon the bench in feathered hats, but the rough red cap and tricolored cockade was the headdress otherwise prevailing. Looking at the jury and the turbulent audience, he might have thought that the usual order of things was reversed, and that the felons were trying the honest men. The lowest, cruelest, and worst populace of a city, never without its quantity of low, cruel, and bad, were the directing spirits of the scene, noisily commenting, applauding, disapproving, anticipating, and precipitating the result without a check. Of the men, the greater part were armed in various ways. Of the women, some wore knives, some daggers, some ate and drank as they looked on, many knitted. Among these last was one with a spare piece of knitting under her arm as she worked. She was in the front row, by the side of a man whom he had never seen since his arrival at the barrier, but whom he directly remembered as Defarge. He noticed that she once or twice whispered in his ear, and that she seemed to be his wife. But what he most noticed in the two figures was that although they were posted as close to himself as they could be, they never looked towards him. They seemed to be waiting for something with a dogged determination, and they looked at the jury, but at nothing else. 
Under the president sat Dr. Manette in his usual quiet dress. As well as the prisoner could see, he and Mr. Lorry were the only men there, unconnected with the tribunal, who wore their usual clothes and had not assumed the coarse garb of the Carmagnole. Charles Evermond, called Darnay, was accused by the public prosecutor as an emigrant, whose life was forfeit to the Republic under the decree which banished all emigrants on pain of death. It was nothing that the decree bore date since his return to France. There he was, and there was the decree. He had been taken in France, and his head was demanded. Take off his head, cried the audience. An enemy to the Republic. The president rang his bell to silence those cries and asked the prisoner whether it was not true that he had lived many years in England. Undoubtedly it was. Was he not an emigrant then? What did he call himself? Not an emigrant, he hoped, within the sense and spirit of the law. Why not, the president desired to know because he had voluntarily relinquished a title that was distasteful to him, and a station that was distasteful to him, and had left his country. He submitted before the word emigrant in the present acceptation by the tribunal was in use, to live by his own industry in England rather than on the industry of the overladen people of France. What proof had he of this? He handed in the names of two witnesses, Theophile Gabel and Alexander Manette. But had he married in England? The president reminded him. True, but not an Englishwoman. A citizeness of France? Yes, by birth. Her name and family? Lucy Manette, only daughter of Dr. Manette, the good physician who sits there. This answer had a happy effect upon the audience. Cries and exaltation of the well-known good physician rent the hall. So capriciously were the people moved that tears immediately rolled down several ferocious countenances which had been glaring at the prisoner a moment before, as if with impatience to pluck him out into the streets and kill him. On these few steps of his dangerous way, Charles Darnay had set his foot according to Dr. Manette's reiterated instructions. The same cautious counsel directed every step that lay before him, and had prepared every inch of his road. The president asked, why had he returned to France when he did, and not sooner? He had not returned sooner, he replied, simply because he had no means of living in France, save those he had resigned, whereas in England he lived by giving instruction in the French language and literature. He had returned when he did on the pressing and written entreaty of a French citizen, who represented that his life was endangered by his absence. He had come back to save a citizen's life and to bear his testimony at whatever personal hazard to the truth. Was that criminal in the eyes of the Republic? The populace cried enthusiastically, No! And the President rang his bell to quiet them, which it did not, for they continued to cry, No! until they left off of their own free will. The President required the name of that citizen. The accused explained that the citizen was his first witness. He also referred with confidence to the citizen's letter, which had been taken from him at the barrier, but which he did not doubt would be found among the papers then before the president. The doctor had taken care that it should be there, had assured him that it would be there, and at this stage of the proceedings, it was produced and read. Citizen Gabel was called to confirm it, and did so. Citizen Gabel hinted, with infinite delicacy and politeness, that in the pressure of business imposed on the tribunal by the multitude of enemies of the Republic with which it had to deal, he had been slightly overlooked in his prison of the Abbey. In fact, had rather passed out of the tribunal's patriotic remembrance until three days ago, when he had been summoned before it and had been set at liberty on the juries declaring themselves satisfied that the accusation against him was answered, as to himself, by the surrender of the citizen Evermond, called Darnay. Dr. Manette was next questioned. His high personal popularity 
and the clearness of his answers made a great impression. But as he proceeded, as he showed that the accused was his first friend, on his release from his long imprisonment, that the accused had remained in England, always faithful and devoted to his daughter and himself in their exile, that, so far from being in favor with the aristocrat government there, he had actually been tried for his life by it. And the foe of England and friend of the United States, as he brought these circumstances into view, with the greatest discretion and with the straightforward force of truth and earnestness, the jury and the populace became one. At last, when he appealed by name to Monsieur Lorry, an English gentleman then and there present, who, like himself, had been a witness on that English trial and could corroborate his account of it, the jury declared that they had heard enough and that they were ready with their votes if the president were content to receive them. At every vote, the jurymen voted aloud and individually, the populace set up a shout of applause. All the voices were in the prisoner's favor and the president declared him free. Then began one of those extraordinary scenes with which the populace sometimes gratified their fickleness, or their better impulses towards generosity and mercy, or which they regarded as some set-off against their swollen account of cruel rage. No man can decide now to which of these motives such extraordinary scenes were referable. It is probable to a blending of all the three, with the second predominating. No sooner was the acquittal pronounced than tears were shed as freely as blood at another time, and such fraternal embraces were bestowed upon the prisoner by as many of both sexes as could rush at him, that after his long and unwholesome confinement he was in danger of fainting from exhaustion. Nonetheless, because he knew very well that the very same people, carried by another current, would have rushed at him with the very same intensity to rend him to pieces and strew him over the streets. His removal to make way for other accused persons who were to be tried rescued him from these caresses for the moment. Five were to be tried together, next as enemies of the Republic, forasmuch as they had not assisted it by word or deed. So quick was the tribunal to compensate itself and the nation for a chance lost that these five came down to him before he left the place, condemned to die within twenty-four hours. The first of them told him so, with the customary prison sign of death, a raised finger, and they all added in words, Long live the Republic! The five had had, it is true, no audience to lengthen their proceedings. For when he and Dr. Manette emerged from the gate, there was a great crowd about it, in which there seemed to be every face he had seen in court, except two, for which he looked in vain. On his coming out, the concourse made at him anew, weeping, embracing, and shouting, all by turns and all together, until the very tide of the river on the bank of which the mad scene was acted seemed to run mad like the people on the shore. They put him into a great chair they had among them, and which they had taken either out of the court itself or one of its rooms or passages. Over the chair they had thrown a red flag, and to the back of it they had bound a pike with a red cap on its top. In this car of triumph, not even the doctor's entreaties could prevent his being carried to his home on men's shoulders, with a confused sea of red caps heaving about him and casting up to sight from the stormy deep such wrecks of faces that he more than once misdoubted his mind being in confusion, and that he was in the tumbril on his way to the guillotine. In wild, dreamlike procession, embracing whom they met and pointing him out, they carried him on, reddening the snowy streets with the prevailing Republican color, in winding and tramping through them, as they had reddened them below the snow with a deeper dye, they carried him thus into the courtyard of the building where he lived. Her father had gone on before to prepare her, and when her husband stood upon his feet, she dropped insensible in his arms. As he held her to his heart, 
and turned her beautiful head between his face and the brawling crowd, so that his tears and her lips might come together unseen. A few of the people fell to dancing. Instantly all the rest fell to dancing, and the courtyard overflowed with the Carmagnole. Then they elevated into the vacant chair a young woman from the crowd to be carried as the goddess of liberty, and then swelling and overflowing out into the adjacent streets, and along the river's bank, and over the bridge, the Carmagnole absorbed them every one and whirled them away. After grasping the doctor's hand as he stood victorious and proud before him, after grasping the hand of Mr. Lorry, who came panting in breathless from his struggle against the water spout of the Carmagnole, after kissing little Lucy, who was lifted up to clasp her arms round his neck, and after embracing the ever-zealous and faithful Pross who lifted her, he took his wife in his arms and carried her up to their rooms. Lucy, my own, I am safe. Oh, dearest Charles, let me thank God for this on my knees as I have prayed to him. They all reverently bowed their heads and hearts. When she was again in his arms, he said to her, And now speak to your father, dearest. No other man in all this France could have done what he has done for me. She laid her head upon her father's breast, as she had laid his poor head on her own breast long, long ago. He was happy in the return he had made her. He was happy in the return he had made her. He was recompensed for his suffering. He was proud of his strength. You must not be weak, my darling, he remonstrated. Don't tremble so. I have saved him. End of Book 3, Chapter 6